Well, good morning. The Senate Committee on State Affairs will come to order. Will the clerk call the roll? Betancourt, Birdwell, Present. Lamatia, Menendez, Middleton, Present. Parker, Perry, Schwartner, Zapparini, Paxton, Hughes. Good morning, everyone. We have a, a decent sized agenda today. With uh, We'll try to move through as expeditiously as we can. For those wishing to testify, uh, there are, there's a kiosk outside of the Senate chamber, so outside those doors directly in front of me. There is a, a kiosk for you to register electronically. They were having some technical difficulties, difficulties this morning, and that's being addressed, so you will be able to register. We have plenty of witnesses to get started, but don't worry, anybody who wants to testify will be able to register and testify. The chair lays out Senate Bill 747, 747. And senators, uh, under current law, if a candidate withdraws from the primary runoff after the initial primary, the remaining candidate is declared the winner of the primary and placed on the ballot. In this case, voters have no choice in a runoff as to who will be the party's candidate. So to be clear, let's say we have a primary, no one breaks 50%. So the top two go to a runoff. If one of those then withdraws, the other candidate is declared the winner of the primary, even though they may have gotten a relatively small number of votes. So under Senate Bill 747, if one candidate withdraws from the, primary, from the runoff early enough to be replaced on the runoff ballot, then the ballot will be in cha the change to include the remaining runoff qualifier. So if one of those top two drops out, then two and three will, would be in the runoff, if that makes sense. Uh, this way, voters will get to choose the candidate they prefer. We do have a committee substitute, which I'll send up at this time. Uh, the bill that we filed allows this to occur, to occur until 21 days after the vote was canvassed. So 21 days after the canvassing of the votes, you would have to make this change. The committee substitute will change this to five days after the deadline for the vote to be Canvas. That'll make sense as we go along. And uh, I'll yield for your questions. Senator Birdwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the committee sub, you mentioned it now goes to five, de five days after the vote is canvassed. What does that functionally mean from the, from the date of the election? No, Senator, thank you. The originally filed bill says 21 days after the vote was canvassed. The substitute says five days after the deadline for the vote to be canvassed. That way we're not at the mercy of when the canvass actually takes place. So there's a deadline for the vote to be canvassed, and we go five days after that, regardless of when the canvass takes place. There's more certainty that way, if that makes sense. So the canvassing is a, is a fluid date. So you've set a firm date based upon the fluid date, which is indeterminate, but still would give us two to three weeks rather than the, I think the three days is in law now, so. Yes, sir. The okay. canvas right. deadline is generally 11 to 15 days after the election, and we'll go five days beyond that. So you're, you said it very well. It's less fluid this way. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Senator. Senators, any other questions? Very well. We'll open up testimony, and we have invited testimony on Senate Bill 747. Chair calls Suzanne Harp. 
And so I'll make your way down and take your time, make your way down to the table here, and I'll get situated. And I'll announce again, if anyone wishes to testify on the, on the bill, uh, register at the kiosk outside, and uh, we will want to hear from you. There we go. Any of those seats are fine. All right, get set up, and when you're ready, uh, you turn the microphone on with the button there at the base, and the green light will come on. Introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Harp, and thank you, Senator Hughes, for your work and help on this important bill and other distinguished senators. I appreciate you having us here today, and I appreciate the invite. My name is Suzanne Harp, and I did run for Congress in Texas's 3rd Congressional District, which comprises Collin and Hunt County. We um, started our race in October, ran a very vigorous race for five months till a March 1st deadline. We had over 200 grassroots volunteers, lots of good in, um, support throughout the county, both at the city level and at the, um, even at some of the um, federal level as well. At the end of our race though, we were come up short to in third place, but we did get 20.8% of the vote in a five-way race. So we were told, as you can imagine, being brand new to politics, we would get two or 3% of the vote. So we felt like it was a nice, valiant effort, and we really wanted to honor not only Texas, but the volunteers and the grassroots movement. So March 1st comes, and we are third place. Hours after that um, was determined, the first place nominee um, was withdrew from the race, which left, um, the next place, second place to be our nominee with just 27% of the vote. So as you can imagine, we were all shocked. We didn't know. We were calling the Secretary of State's office. They didn't know. Everybody had to read the law um, and figure out that, no, that was, we don't, we are not going to be on the ballot for a runoff. So we saw that it was a definite gap in the law and needed to protect Texas. So I'd like you to also consider what happened to the Texas Land Commission and the Texas Railroad Commission. Our first place nominee had more than 48 or 49 percent, respectively. The second place had 14 or 15 percent, respectively. If the, God forbid, the first place nominee were to drop off, our nominee for the Republican Party would have been 15 percent going into the general election, which is leaving, obviously, 85 percent of the vote disenfranchised. So what we would like to do is just see that in a runoff be more congruent with our general election or our regular primary election law. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Senators, any questions for the witness? Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. We'll now open public testimony on Senate Bill 747. Members, we do have, uh, as a resource witness uh, from the Secretary of State's office, Christina Atkins. Anybody need to hear from the resource witness? Sometimes the election code stuff gets complicated. Everybody okay? Very well. The chair calls Trudy Meyer, uh, Susanna Hewlin, Josiah Hewlin, and Ed Johnson. So, a uh, chair calls Trudy Meyer, Susanna Hewlin, Josiah Hewlin, and Ed Johnson. Please make your way down to the table. If you're up in the gallery, we'll give you, if you're in the gallery, we'll give you plenty of time to come down. Again, we're looking, we, we, there's Mr. Johnson. We're looking for Trudy Meyer, Susanna Hewlin, Josiah Hewlin. Well, Mr. Johnson, welcome. You know how to do this, but introduce yourself, even though we know you, and give us your testimony. Uh, Ed Johnson, um, I'm here. Um, excuse me, I don't. I put glasses on for the number again. Um, 747, correct? Uh, Senate Bill 747. I'm for it. Um, my my history, for those who don't know, I had about 20 years in the Harris County elections, seen quite a few elections over the years. Uh, have since retired, 
but um, I, I saw this used as a way to knock people out of primary races, more particularly actually precinct chair races. Um, they would come in and, and, you know, you would have two precinct chairs on, you know, pretty issues going on within the little community that get very heated and they would run a third party, you know, person in there that would steal votes from one of the other two candidates. And when it didn't quite make it to, you know, one getting 50% or you would have three and, and you have two of them there, well, the second place guy would drop out making the one that only got, you know, 40% of the vote, the winner. So uh, I've seen it manipulated with, with a lot of races like that where they, they throw, would put somebody into the race um, to, to be a spoiler and then the spoiler drops out. So it's a great bill. It would solve that problem. It gives people the chance to vote for, you know, the, really the two candidates working instead of the spoiler who, you know, takes some of the vote and then drops out and you don't have the runoff then. Mr. Johnson, thanks for that. We, we, when we saw the, the hole in the law, we knew it needed to be fixed. It had not occurred to me that it could happen as you describe it. And, and you've seen that happen where folks yeah. will game the system. I hadn't even thought about that. Thank you. Yes. Sir, is there any questions for Mr. Johnson? Thanks for your testimony. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll call a, uh, once more with registered uh, uh, for the bill, Trudy Meyer. Susanna Hewlin and Josiah Hewlin. Don't see them. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 747? Seeing none, public testimony is closed. And the bill is left pending at this time. The chair now lays out Senate Bill 921. 921. You may have heard of ranked choice voting. The concept has been around for a while, but it's starting to pick up steam in a couple of parts of the country. And so let me, this is what this bill's about. Let me explain a little bit about how it works, how we've seen it work in other states, and why we believe it would be really bad anywhere in Texas. The ranked choice voting is a, is a, is a very confusing uh, election system. It's being pushed mostly in large cities, but also some states. And it fundamentally changes the election process. It disenfranchises voters, and it allows marginal candidates not supported by a majority of voters to be elected. So to be clear, candidates who do not receive the support of the majority of voters, the majority of voters can be elected under this system. As of December of last year, 64 American jurisdictions have ranked choice voting in place. That covers about 13 million voters, two states, two counties, and 60 cities as of December of last year. 
Now, back in 2001, our Secretary of State was Henry Cuellar, who's now a member of Congress. And when he was Secretary of State, he wrote an election law opinion that ranked choice voting is illegal in Texas. We believe he was correct, but his opinion, of course, is not binding. A Secretary of State's opinion on election law is helpful, but it's not binding authority. And it doesn't keep cities or counties or other Texas jurisdictions from trying to move forward with this. So here's how it works. With ranked choice voting, when you go in to vote, the voter is asked to rank every candidate in a race from his, the number one choice to their last choice. So in a race with five candidates, a voter is asked to rank the candidates from one through five, with the candidate ranked as number one being our first choice, et cetera, all the way through number five. And so after that takes place, when it's time to count the votes, if no candidate wins a majority in the tabulation of the ballots, then the candidate with the fewest number of votes is eliminated, and the voters who selected that candidate as their number one choice have their votes changed to their second choice, and another round of tabulation takes place. If no candidate wins in that second round of counting, the lowest scoring candidate is again eliminated, and the voters who selected that candidate as their top choice, or their second choice, if they already had their first one knocked off, then they have their next choice, the candidate is there number one, and another count is done, and this is done round by round. So this candidate elimination and redistribution of ballots does a couple of things. It continues until one of the remaining candidates gets a majority. But that candidate may have not, may have been the second, third, fourth, or even last choice of the majority of the voters, meaning a candidate could win who is not the first choice of a majority of voters. It's confusing, it's an opaque process, and it's prone to errors. In Alameda County, California, officials uh, found two months after a school board election, just last year, in 2022, a school board election took place, and two months after the race, they realized they had incorrectly counted the votes using ranked choice voting, and they had certified the wrong candidate as the winner. No election official even noticed because it's such a complex, complicated process. It was, only, it was not until an outside advocacy group that went back and looked at the numbers realized the problem, and the election officials admitted it was, it was an error. Uh, back in 2021, in the New York mayor's race, it took eight rounds of vote counting of the 10 candidates over two weeks before a final winner was announced. By the eighth round, by the eighth round, the ballots of more than 140,000 had been thrown out because they did not completely rank all candidate choices. Now, let's talk about that for just a moment. Let's say you're a voter and you're being asked to vote in this ranked choice election and there are five candidates. You're asked to rank one through five, but you're thinking, I don't want to dilute my vote. I'm just going to vote for my first choice and I'm not going to vote for the rest. If you do that, once your first choice candidate gets knocked off, your vote does not count in subsequent rounds. That happened to 140,000 voters in the New York mayor's race in 2021. In fact, we've learned that in states and cities that have tried this, about a third of all voters do not choose more than just the one candidate. So their votes get thrown out in those cases in subsequent rounds. I think you get how this works and the problems that come along with it. Uh, exhausted ballots, that's what they call it when, when those ranked choice elections don't, don't, when your votes don't count all the way down. Many of these ballots are thrown out due to voter error and following the instructions. Ballots that, and then voters that follow the instructions to the letter can be thrown away because their candidates are for the votes, for the, their votes are for the candidate that didn't make it through to that round. Uh, it's confusing, and as candidates come off through multiple rounds, voters, voters go all the way down only if, if they rank them all that they were supposed to, and their candidate is still in the running. It's a very confusing process, and uh, voters don't understand it. Voters are confused by it, and we understand that long and confusing ballots have a way of discouraging people from participating in the process. And so, like with so many items, uh, this is mostly taking root at the city level, and we have to stop it before, again, some of our cities in Texas try to do this and confuse and disenfranchise voters using this really complicated and error-prone system. So that's ranked choice voting. You probably all knew that. Uh, I had to do a little study to get a handle on it, but it's, uh, it's taking root in some parts of the country, and we do not need it in Texas. So that's what the bill asserts, and I will uh, yield for your questions. 
Senator Birdwell. I'm sorry I'm the spring butt today asking all the questions. So let me, uh, the, the intent of the bill is, is solid, but a, a, a more of an administrative question in that the chapter that this is going into is subchapter B, which is the runoff chapter. Based upon where it's written, my sense is, is that it would preclude a rank choice voting in the runoff, but we are in a state of Texas, runoffs are already just the top two. Does this need to go in the chapter that deals with the primary election as opposed to the runoff election? That's a great question. We looked at that, and it's in Chapter 2, which is vote required for election to office, and then that subchapter, which deals with runoffs, because that's when these, these processes would kick in. But they tell us, since it is in the subchapter, in the, pardon me, it's in the chapter dealing with election for office, we're okay. We can tweak that if we need to, but we, we had Ledge Council and lawyers look at it, and they say, since it's in the right chapter, the subchapter is not relevant. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Members, any other questions? We'll open invited testimony and call Chase Martin. The chair calls Chase Martin, uh, Senate Bill 921. Uh, welcome. Get situated there and uh, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Hughes and honorable members of the committee. My name is Chase Martin, and I'm a visiting fellow at the Opportunity Solutions Project. OSP is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We work in 40 states across the country with one clear goal, to help more people achieve the American dream. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today in support of this legislation. SB 921 will protect Texas voters from ranked choice voting, a disastrous and alternative voting system that discounts votes, diminishes confidence, and threatens fast and accurate ballot counting. The bill will provide important clarity to the current general and administrative prohibition on preferential voting systems in Texas. Lawmakers across the country have recognized the problems with ranked choice voting, and in 2022, Florida and Tennessee banned it statewide and preempted local jurisdictions from adopting it. Special interest groups have successfully pushed ranked choice voting at the statewide level in Maine and Alaska through ballot initiatives. Some cities across the country have implemented it, including New York City, San Francisco, Burlington, Vermont, Portland, Oregon, and Cambridge, Massachusetts. Under ranked choice voting, Voters are forced to rank all the candidates in order of their preference, even those they would never support. I think the chairman did a great job of summarizing it earlier. As, as he said, if no candidate wins a majority, then the candidate with the least number of votes is eliminated. The second preference choices of the voters whose candidate was eliminated are then used to retally the votes. The process is repeated until a candidate receives more than 50% of the votes that have not been exhausted. So let's review the problematic track record. Under ranked choice voting, not every ballot that is cast will count towards the election result. In Maine's 2018 second congressional district election, over 8,000 ballots were tossed out and didn't count towards the election result. Bruce Poliquin received 46.3% of the vote ahead of Jared Golden, Golden's 45.6%. But since Poliquin didn't receive 50% of the vote, there was a second round of tabulation. The Secretary of State threw out the 8,000 exhausted ballots. Golden was declared the winner of the, with 50.6% of the remaining ballots, but only 49.2% of the total ballots cast. Ranked choice voting created a fake majority. Golden never actually obtained a majority of votes that were cast in the election. In 2022, special election to fill the seat of the late Alaskan Congressman Don Young nearly 15,000 votes were thrown out. 
before the Democrat Mary Pilato were, was declared the winner. In fact, 60% of voters chose a Republican in the first round, but by the last tally, Petola came out ahead by just 5,200 votes. The exhausted ballots were simply tossed out because they only voted for the other Republican candidate instead of ranking all of the candidates. Now I'll skip ahead because you summarized some of the great talking points of uh, the numbers, but ranked choice voting also threatens fast and accurate ballot counting. New York City's 2021 Democrat, Democratic mayoral primary took 15 days to announce a winner. The New York City Board of Elections ac accidentally included 135,000 test ballots um, in its public posted tally before fixing the error. In Maine in 2022, a technical snafu led to two memory sticks, which had recorded more than 16,000 ballots being corrupted. It took seven days to figure out the deal there. I'll, I'll close with ranked choice voting undermines faith in democracy and voter confidence in election results. SB 921 will provide important clarity in Texas law and protect voters from this situation. I urge you to consider supporting this important legislation. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you for your testimony. Since there's any questions for the witness, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll now open public testimony on Senate Bill 921. And the chair calls Robert Cohen, Andrew Eller, Liz Case Pickens, Susanna Carranza. So Robert Cohen, Andrew Eller, Liz Case Pickens, Susanna Carranza, and Fran Rhodes. First, I didn't call Miss Rhodes the first time. There she is, Fran Rhodes. Come on down, take a seat. Again, we're looking for Robert Cohen, Andrew Eller, Liz Case Pickens, Susanna Carranza, and Fran Rhodes. We normally go from, well, my left to right, right to left. So, Ms. Rhodes, if you're ready, we'll uh, get situated there and introduce yourself, give us your testimony. Welcome. Yes, uh, my name is Fran Rhodes. I am president of True Texas Project. I am representing myself and True Texas Project today in support of SB 921. Uh, <clears throat> True Texas Project is a statewide grassroots uh, political organization where we try to educate and motivate citizens to engage in government. We currently have 18 groups all over the state. So election integrity is one of the top issues among grassroots voters in Texas. We believe that allowing preferential voting systems would create voter exhaustion, diminish voter confidence, and threaten prompt election results. I personally am totally confused by this whole thing for all of the reasons that you laid out, uh, Senator Hughes. I just can't imagine how it works and what a burden it will put on our uh, election poll workers. Um, I have experience working the ballot board in Tarrant County for about four or five years in a row, and that is a huge Herculean job as it is. If things have to be counted multiple times, I just can't even imagine, and I don't want to do it, so don't call on me. <laughs> um, also, I, I think that voters frequently go into the ballot box not really having a clue who they're going to vote for. Or maybe they've been told, okay, this senator and, and that uh, house rep, but they don't know anything else. And ballots are huge in some counties, uh, multiple, multiple pages. And, and people get worn out before they get to the bottom. And, and now we're gonna ask them to say one, two, three, four, five, or 10, or however many candidates are there. Um, I think you're gonna see a lot of uh, voter exhaustion as a result of that. Um, even the well-informed voter doesn't always know every candidate on the ballot. And, and so maybe they use party designations as a way to decide. But now we're asking them to know every single candidate from every party so that we can say one, two, three, et cetera. I think it's too much. Um, ballot exhaustion occurs when voters uh, overvote, undervote, or rank candidates that are no longer in contention. Um, I don't understand how that works, but I read that that happens. 
In some elections, the, the ballot, there are several pages of ballots and, and p voters don't even finish, they uh, just get to the end. Anyway, uh, I think this method of voting threatens so many things on so many levels and uh, we strongly support SB 921 to prohibit it and thank you Senator Hughes for filing it and we urge you all to support the bill, mm. thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Uh, good morning, my name is Robert Cohen. I have a prepared statement I'd like to read from. Uh, to Senator Hughes, committee chair and members of the State Affairs Committee, uh, I wish to register my opposition to SB 921, uh, which bans the use of preferential voting to determine majority vote in the state of Texas. Preferential voting, also known as ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting, is a highly effective means of determining a majority vote and it should not be prohibited. I've noticed that there hasn't been any discussion about how this will affect military or uh, overseas voters. There are approximately 86,000 military and overseas registered voters in Texas. Six southern states use ranked choice voting ballots for deployed active military and other overseas voters, including Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina. These preferential ballots enable these people to have their votes counted during runoff elections. Without a preferential voting ballot, the delay in delivering standard runoff ballots and returning them before the election deadline is unlikely. These people have a right to participate and have their votes counted in runoff elections. Please do not silence them by banning preferential voting. Allowing preferential voting in special elections would save voter time and taxpayer money by eliminating high cost, low turnout runoff elections. Constituents would have representation sooner as well because election results would be known faster than conducting a runoff election. I am a United States Marine Corps veteran who served in Afghanistan, and I explicitly remember being unable to vote in my local runoff elections due to exactly this issue. A vote against preferential voting is a vote against military members such as myself having a, vote, a voice in the very system that we fight to protect. A ban on preferential voting is a bad idea. Please oppose SB 921. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome, introduce yourself, give us your testimony. Hi, my name is Andrew Eller, and I'm the State Republican Executive Committee Man for Senate District 24. I'm here on behalf of the SREC, the Republican Party of Texas, and myself, and we are for the bill. Uh, ranked choice voting, uh, normally abbreviated RCV, I typically call it really confusing to voters uh, because it is inherently uh, confusing, corrupt, opaque, and sometimes uh, viewed as very unconstitutional. RCV violates the one voter, one candidate, one vote principle that we all know and love. RCV is a form of voter suppression as it creates confusion and disenfranchisement for both voters and election officials. Ballot exhaustion is created when a voter, when a voter overvotes, undervotes, or only ranks candidates that are no longer in contention and then the ballot no longer counts. In the end, up to 30% of the ballots in RCV elections are seen to have this problem. That's true disenfranchisement of voters. Uh, RCV disenfranchises voters who do not understand how the non-intuitive system works. This can lead to vulnerable voters being disenfranchised as studies on recent RCV elections have shown. And I'll bring up, you know, Senator Hughes laid it out pretty well what's happened, you know, in some of the other uh, municipalities like New York City. A lot of times we're here, it's, it needs to be education. Well. New York City spent over $15 million educating their voters and they still had problems. You still heard that issues. Uh, is another point, rank choice, ranking candidates rather than voting for only one always results in legitimate ballots being discarded through the RCV multiple counting cycles. During each round of ballot counting, some voters' choices will fall by the wayside and be discarded silencing their, their voices. These ballots become trash can, eliminated, or cast aside ballots. And you heard of the many different examples, such as the Oakland, California mayoral race, the New York City mayoral race, the Alameda County uh, school board races, all of those issues. And I'd also like to point out that uh, both the city of Memphis, 
uh, NAACP opposed our ranked choice voting and New York's uh, NAACP also opposed ranked choice voting because it is voter suppression. And just one uh, other thought, there are currently four bills on preferential voting before this legislature this session and those are very bad bills. So we actually need this bill to be pushed through. And I appreciate your comments. I mean, letting me comment. Thank you for your testimony. Dr. Carranza, welcome. Introduce yourself, give us your testimony. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Susanna Carranza. I'm here representing myself and I oppose Senate Bill 921. Um, I, I'm a, a election judge. I uh, participate in organizations that kind of do little mock elections to explain, you know, how things like that work. Uh, ranked choice voting is actually easier to understand. The systems count themselves. There's no like, you know, we're not in a place that you have to have a person going there and putting ballots in separate piles. Ranked choice voting is much more taxpayer cost efficient because you don't have to have a second runoff election that usually has really low turnout and that disenfranchises voters much more than having to choose multiple candidates. In ranked choice of voting elections, you don't have to choose all candidates. You can just rank however many you're familiar with ranking. That would not disenfranchise anybody. If I, candidates in the ballot and you want to choose them, you can choose them. It promotes uh, consensus candidates because a candidate has to be somebody's second and third choice, so you're much less likely to get extreme views from either side. It, it promotes higher participation because the election itself happens at once. And also, uh, usually most promoters of ranked choice voting promote for nonpartisan elections where you will have multiple candidates and then a, a, run a runoff will be not representative of the whole population. So there are many, many reasons to like ranked choice voting. It's not that complicated. I've actually run uh, ranked choice voting elections for local organizations and it's, it's really, it's a matter of like you use it once you learn and everybody that had never used before, they actually came back to me and saying like, I like it. I wish everywhere, every place was like that because the runoff elections are always problematic. I urge you to oppose this bill. Thank you. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Is there any questions for any of the witnesses? Thank you each for your testimony. Thank you for being here. Uh, the chair now calls uh, Joanne Richards, Trudy Meyer, Jacob Spivak, Ken Moore. Again, the chair calls at this time Joanne Richards, Trudy Meyer, Jacob Spivak, Ken Moore, and Eldon Pearson. Eldon Pearson. Please come take a seat. So we're looking for Joanne Richards, Trudy Meyer, Jacob Spivak, Ken Moore, Eldon Pearson. All right, we'll begin here. When you get, when you get ready, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Eldon Pearson and I am representing myself. I would like to start my testimony with a quote, political parties. They are likely in the course of time and things to become potential engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. Those were the famous words of George Washington during his farewell address in September of 1796. And as we discussed the option of no longer having the discussion on ranked choice voting, I felt these words were important to have echoed throughout this chamber. George Washington, our only independent president, warned the American people in this speech about the detrimental impact that opposing political parties could have on our democracy. Eliminating ranked choice voting entirely will make it nearly impossible for independent candidates to become elected and pours more gasoline on the unprecedented and growing issue of hyperpartisanship. 
A 2020 study taken down the road at the University of Texas found that 30% of Texan voters do not strongly identify with a political party. And a Gallup poll from last month found that 44% of national voters self-identify as independent. With these margins growing, we want representatives who are issue-oriented and committed to serving their constituents' interests, not their parties. With, for all of you sitting at this table, ranked choice voting would liberate you to better serve your constituents, your state, and even yourself by introducing, reintroducing your ability to truly choose how you are voting on issues without the pressure of partisan influence in choosing for you. I urge you not to pass this bill from committee and be guided by the words of our first and only independent president. Will you subvert popular sovereignty or will you join us, the people, and be a champion for the founding principles of our democracy? Thank you. Mr. President, thanks for your testimony. I think Senator Betancourt has a question for you. Mr. President, when you look at the historical record, did you look at how the third party movements have started, like the Populist Party, um, you know, even even back in the 18, you know, 1800s, the Whig parties, et cetera, how they fractured it or in, in that particular period of time? Because I think if you go back and you look at some of the third party movements, you'll see that the that the absorption of ideas, okay, is is what what occurred as opposed to um, uh, you know, really anything else. So I, I would go back and just take a look at the, at the study of the third party movements, everything all the way up to the United We Stand movement through uh, uh, with Ross Perot, and you'll see those issues absorbed by the two majority parties. And those parties have changed over time because we don't have the same majority parties that we started with in the Republic. So I would expand back on, uh, on, on your quotes from President uh, Washington. It'd be a very interesting study. I have research out of it, but thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Thank you. My name is Jacob Spivak. I'm a software engineer with experience on U.S. government, federal IT consulting projects. Um, I came here with some prepared notes, but seeing the testimonies already, um, I've decided to go off script, and hopefully this can be a little more conversational. I appreciate the back and forth we've already seen talking about the third parties. And I do agree that the uh, third parties, the, they typically bring in new ideas that get incorporated into the main parties. And I also observe that the parties do change over time, and we seem to be undergoing some of those changes right now. Um, some people approach this question with the goal of how can we, how can we get away from the two-party system? But I don't think that's necessarily the goalpost. I think the goalpost might just be how can the parties better represent their constituents? So bringing my perspective as a software engineer into this, um, on these government projects that I worked on, we used open source software. Open source software is freedom. If you're not using open source, you are under the control of a closed system that produced that software. So what would it look like if we had an open source election? Uh, software is already very important in many voting systems. It's not, it's not fair to simply discount a system because it's implemented in software. Voting machines right now, many of them are black box systems with no transparency. What would it look like if we had a fully transparent voting system where we had transparency into the system itself, but also full transparency into the voters' preferences? I think one of the issues that we're seeing now is that many of the politicians who are lobbying against ranked choice voting realize that they are already not the first choice of their constituents. How many times have people been told to hold their nose and vote for a politician or to vote or where their vote is essentially a vote against the opposition but not voting for what they're truly in favor of? So I see ranked choice voting as simply one option on the table to improve our elections. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome, introduce yourself, give us your testimony. Uh, my name is Ken Moore. I am a state Republican executive committee man for Senate District 11, uh, Senator Mays District. Uh, there's not a whole lot I can add to what's already been said. I think the way the bill was initially laid out is, is very clear and puts forth most of the issues with it. It will be confusing, and I think especially for those who are older, who are looking at the instructions and trying to figure out what to do with them, we have a system that has served us well for 200 years. Uh, I don't see a need to change it. 
uh, the, it introduces fuzzy math into the equations, which uh, can give us people, give us candidates that uh, no one really wants. And so I would urge you to vote for this bill. I think it's a good one. And thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Thank you very much. I'm Joanne Richards, uh, and I'm testifying on behalf of myself and Ranked Choice Voting for Texas. Um, I've listened to lots of the testimony. Obviously, I am against this particular bill, and I'm against it because it bans all Ranked Choice Voting. Uh, and Ranked Choice Voting for Texas is interested in certain types of elections where we think that Ranked Choice Voting would be of benefit. Um, and the three types are for overseas and um, military uh, voters who uh, are basically disenfranchised uh, during the runoff election period because they can't get their ballots back in time. Uh, and these people are people who are serving the country, uh, and we should be uh, letting them uh, let their voice be heard. Uh, the second is for special elections, and I have written testimony that I left with you that shows what happened in the uh, 6th Congressional District in Dallas uh, with their special election, and the cost of that special election was uh, really quite large per voter. Um, and so I, I will refer uh, to that particular document. It looks like this. Uh, so that you can see it for yourself. And the third is for nonpartisan municipal elections. In nonpartisan municipal elections, I'd like to share my own experience. I live in Austin. I voted in uh, our city council uh, race and mayor race this past uh, uh, election cycle. Um, I preferred multiple candidates, and I would have been perfectly happy with um, not just one of the candidates on the ballot, but several folks on the ballot. And I was forced yet to make a decision on only one. I would have preferred to uh, rank m my, uh, my preferences in hopes that one, two, or three of the people that I voted for would have been elected. Because of the number of candidates, a runoff was forced, um, and it was a costly and negative uh, campaign that I would like to um, eliminate. If I might, one more experience is that I am a returned Peace Corps volunteer. And in 1966, I was not able to vote because I couldn't get a ballot. Thank you for your testimony. Senators, there's any questions for any of our witnesses? Very well. Thank you for being here. Thank you each. Uh, the chair now calls Eric Bronner, uh, Trudy Meyer, Liz Case Pickens. Eric Bonner, Trudy Meyer, Liz Case Pickens. And those are all of the witnesses that we have registered on for or against in a Bill 921. Please have a seat. So if anyone else wishes to testify, please make your way outside the chamber and, and uh, electronically register at the kiosk. It's very simple. There's someone who can help you. So we're looking for Liz Case Pickens, Trudy Meyer, Eric Bronner. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Eric Bronner, and I'm here to register my strong opposition to Senate Bill 921 as both individually and as the founder of Veterans for Political Innovation. I'll be speaking from the heart because I just found out about this bill yesterday. I'm in town for the first time for South by Southwest from Missouri. When I left uh, my home state of Wisconsin in 1993 to go to the Naval Academy, God blessed me with two roommates from Texas, men of deep character and deep faith, and one of whom I reached out to this morning and asked if I could share a bit of his story. His name's Clint Bruce from Dallas, Texas, Garland. He served, uh, he was an all-American linebacker for Navy played in the NFL for a minute, and then served as a Navy SEAL. Clint is one of the close to 50% of veterans who are independent. I'm one of them as well, never joined either major political party, never affiliated with either. And I said, Clint, would you register your opposition to Senate Bill 921? He said, 10,000% yes. Anything that diminishes competition is apart from the founding ethos. There's no reason to, to preemptively ban ranked choice voting based on 
uh, some misinformation. It's a tool that gives voters more power through more choice. Our founders chose plurality voting because that was the only thing available to them. But countries such as Ireland and Australia have used ranked choice voting for over 100 years. In Ireland, they still count the votes by hand without any issues. Everywhere where ranked choice has been implemented in our, in our country, 23 cities and counties in Utah use it. The Republican Party in Virginia used ranked choice voting successfully. And six southern states use it for military and overseas voting. Voters like it. We don't want to disenfranchise our active duty military. The, the average dropout rate uh, of, of participation in runoff elections is 40 percent. Instant runoff voting would, would fix that problem and would have saved Georgia taxpayers $75 million. Thanks for your testimony. Members, any questions? Senator Birdwell. Did I say Birdwell again? You, you, you sat in for Senator Birdwell last week, and, and this <laughs> happens all the time, I'm sure. Senator Badencourt, you're right. B, 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 B. No, no, thank you. Um, thank you for your, uh, for, uh, your visit. I uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, South by Southwest. Thank you. And uh, just a couple comments. Uh, Texas has basically an open primary, so we don't have to register by party here. Right. Um, and I just want to make sure if you, if you had a chance to testify, you knew that we had made that major leap. Uh, some, time, some time ago. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. Members, I'm going to call our resource witness from the Secretary of State's office to, to answer a couple of questions. Uh, There's Ms. Atkins, Christina. Please uh, have a seat, introduce yourself, and uh, we got a couple of questions for you. Uh, good morning, my name is Christina Atkins. I'm with the Secretary of State's office, and I'm here to testify on the bill. Thank you for being here. So help us understand the process now for military overseas ballots. My recollection is that in recent years, the time frame when we need it, when, when there's a reason for a runoff, when there's cause for a runoff, the time frame between the general election or the primary, and the runoff has been extended to allow for overseas military ballots. Will you walk us through that, please? Absolutely, that's correct. Um, so we have, for example, when we're talking about our primary elections, we have our primary occurring in March. Um, a number of years back, we moved the primary runoff date um, in order to accommodate the requirements under the Federal uh, MOVE Act to give our military and overseas voters that 45-day window for which mail ballots are sent out to voters. Uh, there are also a number of military voters that can opt to receive their balloting materials by email. And so email is a way to deliver their balloting materials to them so they can print them off, mark them, and then put them in the mail. Senator Benicourt. Thank you. Senator Benicourt. Um, and uh, we did do a, a major expansion of a portal, I believe, uh, that, uh, that folks can use to track uh, ballots during the previous year. I don't think our previous guest who had just dropped in for Southwest, uh, South by Southwest would know that. Would you describe how that portal is working? Because one of the reasons why I offered that amendment was because not only of, for disabled voters, but for also military uh, voters as well. Um, yes, Senator. Um, as a result of legislative efforts in 2021, we now have a requirement for the state to implement a ballot by mail tracker so that anybody that's voting by mail can log into the system, check the status of their application, including our military and overseas voters, um, and they can check the status of their mail ballot throughout the process itself. Um, what you referenced, Senator, was the fact that now in this online ballot by mail tracker, there is the ability if a voter forgets to include um, their identification numbers on there, they can log into the tracker to make that correction electronically. Right. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, that, that is obviously a big improvement because that information uh, can be uh, accessed directly by the military voter, disabled voter, any voter really, uh, and, and wherever they are in the world, uh, you know, because, they, because it's all online. So thank, I'm glad to hear that we made such good progress from legislation. Uh, it's great to be, I think there was an amendment on your bill, uh, Chairman. I believe so. Yes, sir. Right. Senator Bill 1. Right. Thank you, sir. Senator Birdwell. And I meant Senator Birdwell this time. Nice. Go ahead. Thank good. You. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> it's never Senator Bedgore. It's always Senator Birdwell. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Uh, just a, a couple quick questions. Uh, while I retired back in 2004, so it's been 19 years since uh, I, I took the uniform off, um, I, have, I have voted from overseas. So let me, but I'm, some of the things you just mentioned technologically were not in place when I, uh, when I was on, uh, on active duty. The purpose of the six weeks is for two weeks of the certificate between the regular election and a runoff is first two weeks, and correct me if I'm wrong, first two weeks is the certification of the runoff election mm -hmm. so that the ballot for runoff, the next two weeks can get to the service member. The following two weeks of that 45 days is for the service member to return it. So the real challenge for the service member is, is not that the state will, because I, I dealt with this, not in as an advanced a way as you know, logging in and checking where my vote is. Uh, that was not in place at the time that I was voting overseas. But, but the purpose of that is to, that six weeks is to give the soldier the ability, or sailor, airman, marine, the ability to respond. What the state is not in tr control of and what the soldier or sailor is not in control of is in that intervening six-week period. You know, I've gotten that call where, you know, the colonel says he needs to see you and 48 hours later, I'm on a plane to El Salvador. Or, you know, back in 1991, you know, we're preparing to deploy to, to the first Gulf War. Um, the soldier, the sailor's not in charge of that. The, the Navy veteran, we just had a go Army beat Navy, but the Navy veteran that, uh, that, that came and testified. When those guys in the boomers or the fast attacks go underneath the water, they're not coming back up. I don't know if there's a a mechanism to allow them to uh, have runoff is going to occur, but their ship deployment, once they go under the waves, I don't know if there's a mechanism. Is there such a mechanism for, have, have I explained the system fairly accurately? And at that point, it's really up to the discretion of the, the deployment structure of the services that really determines the soldier's availability. It's not the election structure, but it's the, the, the military services are determining where the service member has to be and the ballot catching up to them may be the challenge. I, I think that's, that's a, a fair statement. I think that's a, gr a great description because, you know, we, we have the tools in state law and in federal law to get our military voters um, their balloting materials, you know, electronically to get, to get it to them a little bit more quickly. But then at that point, it's the service member's obligation and, and whatever their situation is with their deployment to be able to get that ballot, mark it, print it, and put it back in the mail. Um, and you know, as you indicated, when we have individuals that are stationed overseas um, or in hostile fire pay zones, there, there is an, a level of complication that could be there in getting that ballot back. Um, that's gonna vary considerably depending on the service member's circumstances. Right, right. So in, if, if you, are, are, is the proposition to do rank choice voting so that the military member can choose, or the independent can choose, regardless of party, um, uh, at one time, rather than so to, to make sure that the ballot doesn't have to chase the the, the service member, because I always you know registered as a Republican, so I would receive the Republican primary ballot, and then I would receive the the general election ballot. Um, if there was a runoff, I would receive it. Um, but mail was probably a little slower than it is uh, at, at this juncture, thus the, the MOVE Act. Um, so what we've got to decide through is, is that, that process for uh, soldiers making a decision whether, because I, I assume we require service members to, to declare party, and if they, if they declare independent, do they only receive a general election ballot? Is that what happens if they declare independent? Um, th that's correct. If they don't have a particular party affiliation um, where they indicate what primary they want, then they won't get a primary ballot at all. The, the voter has to affirmatively choose the primary. Okay. Um, and, and one thing that you mentioned that I just want to add is with respect to our military voters, there's actually also a provision in federal law that allows them to submit what we call a federal write-in absentee ballot. Um, and so if somebody was in the circumstances that you described where they were being deployed or sent off to another location unexpectedly and they didn't have time to receive that runoff ballot, they actually can do what we call this, this specific write-in ballot and they can send that in on their own 
um, as long as they have already turned in the proper application form, the federal postcard application ahead of time. So for that runoff situation, there, there is that option available to our military voters when they have a change in circumstances, and they may not be able to wait for the, the runoff ballot. Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sure. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Any other questions for the resource witness? Thank you for being here. Is there anyone else present wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 921? Seeing none, testimony is closed. The bill's left pending at this time. The chair lays out Senate Bill 221, 221, and recognizes its author, Senator Betancourt, to explain the measure. The one that, it was, that I wanted to lay out, but we'll, we, we'll handle it either way. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, the genesis for Senate Bill 221 came from numerous voters and municipalities encountered problems when facing various ballot initiatives and charter challenges from 2017 through 2021. Uh, as far back as the interim in 2017, the IGR committee was tasked by Lieutenant Governor Patrick to examine ways that home rule municipalities used to adopt ordinances, rules, regulations, uh, and uh, including those initiated by petition and voter referendum. We're asked to uh, look at if there were some safeguards we could put in place to keep uh, uh, these issues from boiling over to the courts and improving transparency. Effectively, what was happening is that there was a massive amount of uh, ballot issue fights uh, based on the language of the ballots themselves. So the highlights of the bill are to set a statute of, uh, for standard uh, language used on ballots, provide for easier public interaction and understanding of ballot language, allowing for citizen participation during the petition drive and simplifying the petition process, create a non-judicial avenue for citizens to use before being required to file an election uh, challenge, and we'll get back to that, because that's a very important point. And when judicial remedies are required, allowing for a rocket docket in state district court for expediting review upon filing of a mandamus petition and allowing a court to rewrite ballot language if the court deems the language uh, uh, rewrite uh, with uh, necessity of a language rewrite. Uh, any of the perception uh, of, uh, you know, of, of quid pro quo, because sometimes there's a, uh, law firms that are being used uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, process on, uh, on pro bono uh, cases, and provides uh, for bad actor provision for municipalities that are able to meet the statutory set deadline la uh, ballot language, and end the statutory prohibition against religious institutions from assisting circulation of petitions. Um, the, uh, uh, the, we have a committee substitute, uh, and are we going to lay that out at this time, or do we have that? It's just changing it to a legislative council rule. Okay. Oh, basically, yeah, the, the committee substitute was to change to a ledge council uh, version of the bill. Uh, and uh, besides that, uh, there are no, uh, except minor changes to the caption. Uh, and so we're going to hear from people that have been directly involved in these petition challenges. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, we've got stories of uh, the past that we can talk to uh, on the, during a, a testimony. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, committee members, any questions for the author? No questions. Very well. We'll open public testimony. As we get ready for, for witnesses, does anyone uh, need to hear from our resource witness, Ms. Atkins from the Secretary of State? Any questions for her? Very good. So the chair calls Liz Case Pickens, Veronica Warms, Trudy Meyer, Susanna Hewlin, Josiah Hewlin. 
Again, the chair calls the following witnesses. Please make your way to the table and have a seat. Uh, Liz Case Pickens, Veronica Warms, Trudy Meyer, Susanna Hewlin, and Josiah Hewlin. Welcome. When you get situated there, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Thank you. Um, my name is Veronica Warms, and I am a legal fellow representing the Texas Civil Rights Project. Uh, Chair Hughes, Vice Chair Paxton, and members of the Senate State Affairs Committee, I am here today to testify in opposition to SB 221. Specifically, we oppose imposing an oversight regime on ballot proposition language under the discretion of the Secretary of State's office. Under this bill, the Secretary of State, who is an unelected political appointee, would have the unilateral authority to determine, in that official's judgment, a city's proposed ballot proposition language is misleading, inaccurate, or prejudicial. The secretary can then request that a city redraft the proposition to correct the defect up to three times, after which point the secretary can just redraft the proposition. This three-round back-and-forth process could easily take a number of weeks, and after that time, if the city opposes the new ballot language, the parties involved will end up in the same place they currently do, in court, where the dispute may very well take even more weeks or months to resolve. Overall, this bill will just limit the amount of time that local governments have to actually prepare the ballots for upcoming elections, while doing nothing to prevent local governments or the Secretary of State's office from ending up in a court dispute over the ballot proposition language. Given these concerns, we urge the committee not to report this bill favorably. Thank you. Question. I thank you for your testimony. Senator Bettencourt, you're recognized. Um, we have uh, some issues with, um, I'll read through these because I'm going to get to Sugar Land in a second. Uh, San Marcos, where city sued petition organizers directly. San Antonio, where they refused to count petitions. Bastrop, where the city splits the petition into five charter change items, even though the charter change addressed only one section of the city charter. Richmond, where the city refused to count petitions. Austin, in 2021, where the Texas Supreme Court ordered the city to change deceitful language. But the question I'm asking you is, in Sugarland, apparently where they denied to count the petition signatures because the petition didn't follow the city charter form for initiative referendum, even though it was filed under local government code 9.004, why did the city not uh, count their petitions of, uh, of, of petitioners when it was filed correctly under state uh, local government code 9.004? I can't speak for the city, um, but what I can tell you is that uh, this is an undemocratic measure where we're giving state oversight over local ballot proposition language. Well, can I? That's all I can speak to. Okay, well, I mean, I've got six examples here, and I haven't even rolled out the big guns on the city of Houston because that went through quite a, 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 sp a period of time. Um, but where you have petitioners that are being sued by their government, where their government is refusing to count their petitioners. Um, I see there's some written testimony from the city of Sugarland, so I'll be asking them that exact same question. Um, where you have repeated issues to the point where the Supreme Court says that the language uh, on, uh, on one change in the city of was deceitful. I'm not, that's not my term, that's the qu direct quote from the uh, Supreme Court. So don't you think that's an issue here? that the top-down guidelines need to correct? I can't speak for the city. I'm here to speak for the Texas Civil Rights Project, and I've given you our opinion on the matter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members. Any other questions for the witness? Very well, thank you for being here. Uh, chair calls still looking for Liz Case Pickens, Trudy Meyer, Susanna Hewlin, Josiah Hewlin, also Honorable Chuck DeVore, Ed Johnson. So 
I had not before called a Simmerman DeVore at Johnson. So we're looking for Liz Case Pickens, Trudy Meyer, Susanna Hewlin, Josiah Hewlin, Chuck DeVore, Ed Johnson. Oh, and if everyone, no, we got just enough seats. All right, thank you guys. Ed, come on down. All right, Mr. Johnson, if you're ready, get situated there, introduce yourself, give us your testimony. Uh, I am for the bill. Get closer to the microphone, too, so we can hear closer, you. A little closer to the microphone. Yeah, Ed Johnson, I am uh, for the bill. Um, got to get the number again here. Uh, Benton Court, uh, it was uh, uh, 2221. 221, yes, sir. We, we know you test found a lot. 221, go ahead. And, uh, you know, I think this is a really good bill. It, it definitely, from the last set of testimony, makes this process a lot more dim uh, democratic or democracy. Um, it gives the public a chance to have an input without being going through some kind of court legal battle to get their, you know, petition presented. Um, currently, the elected officials and people that are running the elections don't know the intricacies, details sometimes of some of these issues that could come forth like, uh, you know, the public does. Um, so it gives them a great avenue to be able to get to the Secretary of State to have them look and review this. The Secretary of State's not the end all, uh, as the, the attorney before was saying, in this decision, they are just going to make suggestions. If the Secretary of State's suggestions aren't followed, well, then it goes to court. Um, so it's, it's a good tool to help clean up ballot language. And a lot of times these entities hide their issues uh, or have reverse double negatives in their ballot language that makes it very confusing for the voter. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mr. Johnson. Senator Bettencourt has questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Johnson, in, in, you've done many petition drives and one of the, uh, the uh, obvious uh, points is that you've got a group of citizens that come together for a cause. Um, they may not be the most politically uh, sophisticated outfit because they maybe just came together, this is the first time they've been active. And so they're really not up on all the petition regulations, et cetera. I think one of the important parts of the bill uh, is to create a non-judicial avenue for citizens to use uh, been, before running into a just a pure judicial challenge because part of the problem that I see here with you know these uh, these problems like in Austin, uh, San Marcos, uh, Sugarland, Bastrop, Richmond is I, I think that there's an expectation level uh, that once they've turned in petitions they're done and they don't realize they could be involved in a very difficult uh, you know protracted uh, you know, uh, in some cases, judicial fight, and I'm hoping to get a non-judicial path through. Your opinion? Yes. Um, no, that's 100 percent true. You know, these are uh, usually local citizens that have some problem or some concern that they're trying to address that group together that will file a petition. None of them have been in politics or, you know, in the legal system before. And this gives them an avenue to take the Secretary of State to have the Secretary of State review it to determine if there is a problem or not. Um, if you put that legal battle problem in there or obstacle in there, it's usually one that they can't overcome because these people are volunteers, community members that are working together, and they don't have the funds to fight a legal battle just to have their petition heard. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Welcome, introduce yourself, give us your testimony. Hello, my name is Josiah Hewlin. I am from Willis, Texas, and I'm in favor of SB 221. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome, introduce yourself, give us your testimony. My name is Susanna Hewlin, and um, I'm also from Willis, Texas, <laughs> we may be related. And um, I agree and am in favor of this bill, SB 20, 221. Very good. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. My name is Liz Case Pickens. I'm from SB 28. And um, good afternoon, members. I am 
in support of Senator Betancourt's bill. Um, I'm from Abilene, Texas, and we just had to do a petition um, for our to make our city a sanctuary city for the unborn. And um, based on the way the process is now, we had to hire attorneys to be able to do that, and I really believe this would be very helpful for citizens groups. So I'm in support of SB 221. Thank you. Assemblyman DeVore, welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Chuck DeVore. I'm here on behalf of the Texas Public Policy Foundation in support of SB 221. Uh, there are five things that really stand out about this bill that I think are, are very important. Uh, and they're all in the context of the sort of roadblocks uh, that municipalities and other local uh, entities often put in front of uh, citizen activists uh, seeking to petition, petition redress of grievances. I, I think, first of all, and we've heard it already, uh, the issue of the language of the uh, ballot proposition, specifically its title, oftentimes you'll see uh, local jurisdictions uh, create language that is confusing or, uh, in fact, it, uh, the opposite of the intent of the initiative. This provides for a process to, uh, to correct that uh, defect. Uh, the other, I think, important thing is the waiver of governmental immunity. Uh, you know, you have these local entities with virtually unlimited resources compared to citizen activists uh, waiving governmental immunity with regards uh, ballot propositions, I think, is a very important step to try to prevent the cities and other local jurisdictions from doing this sort of thing in the first place. Uh, signatures on the petition, that's a third issue. Uh, we often see with mail-in ballots, for example, uh, an effort to cure signatures, whereas with petitions, you'll see any excuse to throw out signatures. Uh, this fixes that issue. The format of the petition, uh, that's another way that cities or uh, local governments uh, disqualify large numbers of petitions. And lastly, uh, the prohibition on any uh, uh, sort of restrictions on petition circulators, I think, is also important. Another technicality that's used to often prevent uh, the proper exercise of citizen participation. Um, Senators, any questions? Sen Senator Bettencourt. Uh, uh, Chuck, thanks for your testimony. You made an important point that there seems to be barriers being placed in front of, of, of petitioners for. Um, for obvious, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, for reasons that I, I can't fathom because you want to uh, let the people, uh, you know, vote and speak on whatever issue they, that, that they have. And uh, I, you made a point about that. So would you like to reamplify what some of the experiences that you've seen or, or just the general comment uh, that you made? Uh, thank you, Senator. I think, uh, again, part of the uh, one of the great examples of the most recent case here in the city of Austin uh, over Proposition A during the 2021 election cycle, uh, you saw this uh, interesting fight where you had the quintessential rewriting of the ballot language by the city to be purposefully uh, confusing and negative toward what the uh, people uh, circulating the petition were trying to accomplish. And of course, it, uh, you know, the city ends up winning at the uh, Court of Appeals, but it goes all the way to the Supreme Court uh, where they won. Now, the challenge, I, I think, is that the group that was offering this had a little more resources, perhaps, than the average citizen group. If they didn't, uh, you likely would have seen uh, the petition uh, gatherers completely frustrated in their ability to get a petition or, a circula uh, or an initiative on the ballot. Uh, only because they had a little more resources than perhaps the normal group, they were able to overcome and uh, work it all the way through to the Texas Supreme Court. Uh, so I think that it's a great example. It's like the exception that proves the rule because most citizen groups do not have those sorts of resources. And at the very first roadblock that would be thrown up, they'd be done. They, they, they would have to give up and just go home and try again another time. Um, Chuck, I'm going from memory, but I think the uh, city of Houston went through a period where they lost five straight of these legally, okay? Um, and uh, it seems that under legal review, 
uh, that these uh, that what's occurring here um, is uh, is pejoratively against the petitioners. But what do you think of the idea of having a non-judicial review so we can keep this out of the courts and solve problems before they end up tying up taxpayer money uh, for, in some cases, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, five losses in a row, much less the fact right. that the petitioners had to win those cases. Well, what I like is the way this bill strikes the balance is that, yes, it does bring in the Secretary of State, and there is this iterative process. If the city is acting in a responsible manner, that should solve the problem and do, do so with greater speed than involving the courts. If, on the other hand, they continue to press the matter, I think that the uh, portion of the bill that waives governmental immunity uh, for this purpose uh, is operative. In other words, there could be some penalty insofar as attorney's fees if the uh, jurisdiction continues to press the matter and is found to be on the wrong side at the end of the day. Thank you for your testimony, Chuck. Mr. Lamatia, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this may be a question for you or for our author, but what happens in a mandamus action if the language in question was approved by the Secretary of State or even written by the Secretary of State and then the mandamus action occurs? My understanding is that there is an iterative process that could happen up to three different times. Is that to what you're referring? Yeah. Right. So in that case, would the city still be liable for attorney's fees in those issues if the Secretary of State was the one that wrote the language or approved the language? Well, that's a suggestion, I think, from Mr. DeVore, but... Yeah. My understanding, as far as the attorney's fees, is if it remains at that level, that they, there's likely not going to be that sort of a requirement. It's only if it ends up in the courts. That was my reading of the bill. Uh, perhaps the uh, author has a different interpretation. Okay, and, and to that, Senator, um, you know, and then if you have to go into uh, judicial remedies, what we've got now is a rocket docket set up in this so that you can get there quickly and get it resolved. Part of the problem is attorney's fees ends up being a very large sum due to the delays in process, and you've got pleas to the jurisdiction even. I've even seen that in here. Um, so, uh, you know, so you get to a court quickly upon filing a mandamus uh, petition, and then that lets the court rewrite the language uh, if it needs to be. Well, I, and I would hope that after three tries, the Secretary of State would not necessarily have gone 0 for 3, but, um, I, but that's why it's there, so that there's an issue, so you can get to a court if you have to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Eulen, Ms. Eulen, Ms. Pickens, Mr. Vore, thank you each for your testimony. Thank you for being here. Are, are you all two the newest ones, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask? Is this the first time you've all testified on something? Yes, sir. Yes. I could tell. Just anyway, so thank you for coming all this way. Is there anything else you want to say? Since we, if you're, uh, we have like a 50% of your town here. No, I'm <laughs> We appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 221? Seeing none, the public testimony is closed, and that bill will be left pending at this time. Uh, the chair now lays out Senate Bill 1052-1052 and introduces its author, Senator Springer, to explain the measure. Welcome, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I think I just got a Lenten special by my uh, uh, Senator Betancourt, so I appreciate that. Since you were sitting in my seat in finance, I thought we would actually recognize you as Senator Betancourt, but uh, I'm just trying to catch up with me being recognized as Senator Birdwell. We just keep <laughs> passing the baton till we get to the end of the 31, but go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. This bill simply extends the amount of time a judge can be paid 
for prior to polls opening from one hour to two hours. Election judges are frontline workers stationed at our voting polls who assist Texans in exercising their cherished right to vote in a free election. Although election judges receive compensation for their time, most are motivated by the desire to do their part of democracy by ensuring a fair and honest process at the grassroots level. The wages for working at the poll sites can range between about $15 to $20, or I'm sorry, $13 to $15 an hour, depending on the election type and the assigned roles uh, that they have. This bill is permissive, so counties that, uh, do not want to have to do it, don't have to do that. But in my home county, in Cook County, I know that you know, we, we've got a lot of, uh, especially ladies who've done this for years and years that are well above 65. You know, we've now gone from the days of when they walked in, they opened the poll book, they slid the ballots out and they were ready to go to now we have to get the computer set up and do all these things. And then I think we just allow those election administrators to work with the county commissioners to figure out if they wanna do this and that's why it's permissive. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Springer. Uh, members of the committee, any questions for the author? Very well, we'll open uh, public testimony. And as we do that, uh, we do have Christina Atkins here from the Secretary of State's office. Senators or Senator Springer, uh, all senators, any questions for the, for the resource witness? Very well. The chair calls uh, on Senate Bill 1052. The chair calls Liz Case Pickens and Ed Johnson. Welcome back. You guys just pick a seat you like, make yourselves comfortable, and we'll uh, continue to go from your right to left. And so when you're all set, Mr. Johnson, get situated there. We're, we're here on 1052. Okay. Uh, Introduce yourself. Don't number this time. Oh, you're, you're doing great, man. Introduce uh, Ed, yourself. Give us your testimony. Uh, Ed Johnson, um, here for Senate Bill 1052. Um, as before, I've spent 20 years in Harris County doing different election tasks and processes. Get a, little, so, get a little closer to the mic so we can. Uh, doing, doing different election tasks and processes. So I have seen this um, firsthand. And in fact, my wife was the election judge for 25 years, I think. Um, so I know that it takes longer than an hour usually to set up a polling location. Um, but when I was in the clerk's office, we were telling them all, you only get one hour on your pay sheet to you know, come set all this up and we're, that's all we're gonna pay you for. Um, quite often though, people were honest and they would put down the amount of time that it really took them to set up, which could be up to two hours usually, or maybe even a little more. Uh, when we would get those in and we gave it to our county HR department and our county attorney, they said, you're paying them. He said, there's federal law that requires you to pay people for hours worked. I said, I don't care what the election code says. So, um, you know, it, this is basically, you know, puts us a little more in line with, with federal law and, and, you know, paying people for compensating them from what they work. It's a, a great bill. It will take a lot of election departments out of, you know, breaking the election code by paying people for the hours that they actually worked. Uh, thanks for your testimony. Speaker, welcome. Introduce yourself again, even though we know, and give us your testimony. I'm Liz Case Pickens. Um, I reside in Abilene, but I've been working elections in Dallas County for the last 30 years. And we have over 400 polling locations in Dallas County. And to get election judges to work is a very difficult thing. And what you find when you go to these trainings is you have a lot of our election judges who've been doing this for decades, and they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And now that we have the electronics that we have, um, it's a lot more complicated process. Our equipment is big and heavy and difficult to set up. And my husband's been election judge for 40 years, and he is an engineer and he is type A, and he can get things done in a manner that is unlike most people, but it is still a very difficult setup process. He can get it done in an hour with his assistant, but not many people can. I think this would really help us to 
be able to get more people. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, Senators, any questions for the witnesses? Thank you both for being here, sharing your experience. Anyone else present wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 1052? Seeing none, public testimony is closed, and the bill's pending at this time, but we'll probably move it pretty quickly, Senator. Thank you for being here. Local yes, sir. <laughs> the chair now lays out Senate Bill 825, 825, and recognizes its author, Senator Betancourt, to explain the measure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Under Section 2212.028 of the Texas Election Code, if a candidate w uh, wishes to request a recount of the election, the candidate must file an application for recount by 5 p.m. on the second day after the day of the canvas. Uh, unfortunately, there's no uh, a provision uh, for major holidays or weekends. Uh, so the need for this bill became apparent on the canvas uh, at uh, done on November 8th, 2022 elections in Harris County. They canvassed on November 22nd, which is Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, obviously, uh, candidates were, will be unable to have access to uh, any of the uh, uh, needed offices on Thanksgiving Day. So uh, as a result, uh, a candidate only had one day to file an application for recount. As we're all aware, race can change from one Candidate winning to another uh, due to the time of close on an election day uh, canvas due to the fact that you're counting, uh, you know, ballots that uh, uh, have uh, come in, uh, you know, post the uh, informal or the unofficial results that are posted uh, the election at the time. So this would give candidates one more day to file an application and would give it legal time to the next, uh, uh, you know, uh, regular business day. Uh, past a Saturday, a Sunday, or a legal holiday. And so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think that one's pretty straightforward. Thank you, Senator. Members, any questions for the author? We do have a resource witness from the Secretary of State's office in case the Senator needs a testimony from her, do we? Very well. Chair calls Sharon Albertson. Sharon Albertson testifying. The chair calls Liz Case Pickens, Trudy Meyer, Susanna Hewlin. So we're on Senate Bill 825. And those folks who have registered to testify on, for, or against this bill, please make your way down. We'll give you plenty of time. Again, we're looking for Liz Case Pickens, Trudy Meyer, Susanna Hewlin, Josiah Hewlin on Senate Bill 825, if you still wish to testify. Mr. Johnson, are you testifying on this one? Come on down. 
chair calls Ed Johnson. Senate Bill 825, and I'll ask if there's anyone else wishing to testify on for or against Senate Bill 825. Make sure you're registered outside on the kiosk. Mr. Johnson, welcome back. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Uh, Ed Johnson. Uh, I am for Senate Bill 825. Uh, this, is a, this is a great bill. Uh, working in the election world for, for years, uh, I've seen lots of different election departments uh, use the very short time period you had to file for a recount as a way not to do a recount. You know, uh, you, you had to send it in that weekend and you faxed it to them and their fax machine ran out of paper and they never got it and just, oh well, time's passed or you didn't dot the I on the form and they said it's not complete. Um, so, and there was no way to follow up with them to check to see if that was true, if they received it, if everything was correct. So this gives you another day, keeps it where it's not being filed on the weekend or a holiday so that you can actually communicate with the office in filing. And a recount election, one that's, one that's really going to make a difference, is one that's like 10 votes different in an election. So you're waiting actually in those races till almost the day of the canvas because you're looking for the overseas military votes and the provisional votes and all those come in and you only have a day's time to decide oh i'm going to file a recount now because i'm only one vote off or two votes off and and you know then it'd be the weekend and you couldn't do it so i've seen quite a few uh in in different places where they were unable to file a recount to try to get a determined outcome of the election Thanks, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. DeVore, welcome back. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. My name is Chuck DeVore. I'm here on behalf of the Texas Public Policy Foundation to testify in favor of Senate Bill 825. Uh, as I'm sure everyone at this table knows, uh, people who have uh, uh, put their name before the public to run for office, uh, the end phase of a campaign can be a very chaotic and emotional time. Uh, there's an enormous amount of paperwork to be considered, uh, significant uh, decisions that have to be made that might bear on the future political viability of a candidate. And therefore, uh, offering an extra day to file for a recount and accounting for uh, holidays, I think, is a common sense measure uh, that will allow for uh, this very important function to be uh, considered with more deliberation uh, and more preparation, which I think uh, benefits both the candidate and the process of elections. Thank you very much. Um, Senators, any questions for either of our witnesses? Very good. Thank you both for being here. Is there anyone else present wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 825? Seeing none, public testimony is closed. The bill is left pending at this time. The chair now lays out Senate Bill 175, 175, and recognizes its author, Senator Middleton, to explain the measure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Today I'm laying out Senate Bill 175, and I wanted to take a moment to thank everybody for coming here today, uh, everyone for and against, uh, on both sides of it, from taking the time to come up from the community. A lot of local elected officials are here today, uh, and I just want to take a moment to recognize the sacrifice you made to come up to your state capitol. It is my honor to bring Senate Bill 175 today. Senate Bill 175 will ban the practice of taxpayer-funded lobbying in the state of Texas. And taxpayer-funded lobbying is the use of public funds by political subdivisions for registered Austin lobbyists. And this practice occurs in two different ways, either through the direct contracting or hiring of someone required to register as a lobbyist under Chapter 305 of the Government Code, or two, through the payment of public funds to a nonprofit state association that primarily represents political subdivisions of the state and employs or contracts with the person required to register as a lobbyist under Chapter 305. And this bill prohibits these two methods of taxpayer-funded lobbying. 
It's fundamentally wrong that $75 million per year of local property tax and taxpayer money is spent annually on Austin lobbyists that act as a middleman between local and state elected officials. Taxpayers don't need an Austin lobbyist middleman. Elected officials are supposed to directly represent their communities, whether that's at the state level or local level. And better than an Austin lobbyist, every taxpayer in the great state of Texas has a state representative and state senator to represent them in Austin. Senate Bill 175 encourages that direct communication between elected officials by removing the Austin lobbyist middleman. We should not give certain elected officials special treatment to use taxpayer funds to have an advantage over the voices of local voters at their state capitol. Taxpayer-funded lobbying uh, can trend to the unethical at times as well. Frequently, taxpayer-funded lobbyists are hired to work against legislation that is in the best interests of taxpayers and parents as well. Taxpayer-funded lobbyists have opposed election integrity reforms. They've opposed the ban on a state income tax. They opposed fixing the teacher retirement system pension, SB 12, in 2019. They are lobbying currently against trusting and empowering Texas parents through parental rights. Of course, they also opposed property tax relief and reform, and even opposed increased voter input in property tax increases, and at times have even wanted a higher motor vehicle gas tax, which, you know, we're right now seeing record gas prices. So, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, today you're likely to hear many misrepresentations of what this bill does and does not do, so I wanted to take a moment to talk about its intent um, and its impact and, and provide clarity on some of those misrepresentations. So, this bill does not affect chambers of commerce, parent teachers associations, fire associations, police associations, sheriff associations, or teacher associations, because those are individual dues-paying associations. Individuals have a choice to join those groups, but right now, taxpayers in the state of Texas have no choice but to pay for taxpayer-funded lobbyists that oftentimes they're very likely to disagree with. And at the end of the day, what that is, is forced speech by taxpayers. This bill does not ban or prohibit associations such, such as the Texas Association of Counties, the Texas Municipal League, or Texas Association of School Boards. It doesn't ban them from providing legal advice, risk pool insurance, continuing education, legislative tracking or bill reading, bill analysis to support or oppose bills, bill recommendation, recommendations, sending newsletters, or providing regular updates to political subdivisions, as long as those associations do not hire someone under Chapter 305 that is required to register as a lobbyist. And none of those services I just pointed out would require anyone to register as a lobbyist. And this bill also does not prohibit local elected officials or their staff from communicating with members of the legislature or using public funds to travel to Austin to testify before the legislature because there is an exem a large exemption from registration under the lobby laws in Chapter 305 for local elected officials and their staff. And at the end of the day, all levels of government are elected to directly represent our constituents' voices without that Austin lobbyist middleman. And today I also have a committee substitute that I just wanted to take a moment to lay out here. So the committee substitute removes the repealer uh, that was in the original as filed version of the bill, bill and that was 89.02, which was repealed. And so we put that back in. And what that does is it explicitly shows that counties may associate. I don't believe that that's necessary because right now counties are not explicitly granted the authority to, to hire registered lobbyists, but we did put that back in uh, and, and restored that explicit authority under 89.002. Additionally, the committee substitute makes conforming changes to align that section with the ban. Uh, so what this means is the conforming changes actually improve the ability of Texas Association of Counties to take positions on legislation by removing subdivision four because prior to this committee substitute and under the current law today, an employee of Texas Association of Counties could not directly or indirectly attempt to influence legislation or testify before committee without an invitation of that committee. So that is repealed, so it actually 
grows the ability of Texas Association of Counties to come before committee and, and support or oppose legislation. Um, and then also I wanted to point out that that section, of course, has to conform with section 556-0056 that you know, they do not expend public funds on a someone required to register under chapter 305 of the government code as a registered lobbyist. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will yield for questions. Thank you, Senator Midland. Senator uh, Birdwell has questions for you. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Senator, let me, uh, I think I caught where you went to the committee sub. So let me just, for the record, clarify, if, uh, if I may, two things. In, uh, in the committee sub, uh, and you and I, I think, had spoken about this, um, if the affiliation of a geopolitical subdivision is now done by individual membership, like I think you mentioned with the Police Chiefs Association, the Sheriff's Association, individual members pay out of their own revenue, not out of taxpayer revenue. That becomes what I think you called a member-based organization. This bill will do that and take membership in TAC, TML, maybe some others, out of the taxpayer realm of general appropriation dollars to pay for membership to where individual members pay for membership. And as the base bill read, it did that, but then still precluded TAC or TML from being able to uh, uh, render its opinions in a lobby format to the legislature, even though the, if the bill passed in its current form without the, the committee sub, you would have a First Amendment problem on freedom of association telling a now a private dues-paying entity that it cannot lobby. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, so really the, it, it tracks the intent of the bill, the committee substitute does, which is we really want to encourage individuals right. to join associations as they do with, you know, teachers and but police the new and fire and sheriff. And, and of course, it still does allow, even under the committee sub and the, the original version as well, for public funds to go to an entity that only represents government, not the individuals, only represents government as long as they don't hire a contract with someone that's required, right. required to register, right. basically. Right. So, the, so what I'm trying to get to is, is making sure that the bifurcation has actually occurred in the committee sub, that, that if now TAC and TML are member-driven organizations and not a government organization, that takes them out, that, that puts them now into that First Amendment realm as private citizens that have coalesced as opposed to right. government entities using taxpayer money. And your committee sub allows that, I think as you'd laid out, uh, not only allows them to now be heard as an association by being a private membership entity, but it actually gives them more ability to be heard uh, uh, as opposed to what current law says. And that is a, that I've, I've understood this correctly. And I think that's a, something, a change that probably will occur here where they become a, a, an individual organization where they represent individual commissioners, county judges, city council members, school board members, because right now, the way they're set up, like Texas Association of School Boards does not represent the individual school board members, they represent the government entity that is a school board. The same with Texas Association of Counties, it, they don't represent the individual commissioners or the county judge, they represent the government entity. And you know, from I think what we've all seen around here, um, the individual dues paying organizations that represent individual members, frankly do a better job uh, than the ones that represent the government entities themselves, right? right. Uh, because those, those interests can conflict a lot of the times. Um, and I know you're gonna hear about some of it today uh, and committee testimony of, regarding an issue that we've had in Galveston County with the county treasurer's office. Um, and we, we've got some good testimony on that here today. Okay. So I, I just wanted to make sure that we were, that clear bifurcation had now occurred in the committee substitute as opposed to base bill going to an individual member organization now affords them the ability to coalesce individual commissioners, individual council members, 
within those association and we're not violating that First Amendment right of what is now a privately funded entity as opposed to a taxpayer funded entity. Second question is on in your the fact sheet that you gave us in the uh, with your letterhead that, that you gave us. It's not in the bill, but what is in the packet you gave us. There's a paragraph that's a, that frequently asked questions. Would this bill prohibit the use of non-employee contract consultants or organizations which advise political subdivisions on legislative issues that affect them or provide bill tracking information, legislative alerts, advisories, or similar information to local governments, local elected officials, or even members of the legislature? The answer is no, no such services have never, such services have never triggered the lobby registration requirement or thus unaffected by the bill. So the question would then be, um, based upon the, the committee substitute, is it, so I want to be very, very granular here in, in stove piping the question to make sure it's directly applicable to what I'm thinking through. If a city, I've, I've got numerous, just as you do, you know, I've got 12 counties worth of folks. Um, if a city wanted to use such a tracking, in fact, Mayor Jensen from Grand Prairie's here, he's got a unique circumstance where half of his city's in Dallas County, half of his city is in Tarrant County, and the, the overlapping geopolitical subdivisions that he deals with, even if he's not as interested in dealing with the legislature, he's got to have somebody tracking all of the different other governmental entities making decisions that impact his, his area. And I've got similar in the more urbanized areas of, the, of my district. Does the, if, I'll just say, City of Waco wants to use somebody to build, do the bill tracking, if that individual happens to be a 305 entity, can they still do bill tracking without lobbying, or does it have to be somebody that is outside the 305? I may be qualified to be a 305. Does that preclude me from being that uh, bill tracking entity for information, legislative reserves, or advisory? So if I'm qualified as a 305 registered for organization X, but city Y comes to me to want to track, does that disqualify me from from tracking because I'm registered as a lobbyist for something else? Well, so they cannot spend public funds on an association that represents government, so not the individual, you know, city council uh, right. example we had a second ago, that hires or contracts someone that's required to register a lobbyist. At, however, bill tracking and legislative analysis like that does not require you to register as a lobbyist. So under the chapter 305 right now, they're basically three ways. One of them is the least common, and that's the, what I call the taxpayer-funded entertainment lobbyist. Um, and that's say, that a, last, say that last part, taxpayer-funded what? Taxpayer-funded entertainment lobbyist. That's where they're spending more than about $880 per calendar quarter and buying meals or entertainment or, you know, I don't really know of many cities or counties doing that, honestly. Uh, so it's really the least common. So the most common way that, that that would trigger a lobby registration is compensation of $1,760 per calendar quarter and more than 40 hours more or more per calendar quarter to influence the outcome of legislation. So that means face-to-face -face time with you or your staff, right? So that does not include bill tracking. And we have a second provision here that's very important um, that is a total exemption for local government and their staff from having to register. Total exemption. Um, and that includes members of the judicial, legislative, executive branch, state, state government, or any political subdivision of the state is not required to register under the compensation or hours threshold while acting in their official capacity as an employee of that public entity. Right, so that, that's really the exemption that applies to pretty much every city, county, school district, you name it, um, where they can have someone that works for them as the county judge's secretary, you know, that is helping with the bill tracking, and then they can still have those bill tracking services with an association, right, that right. here are the good and bad bills this week, uh, they send it out, 
it goes to every member in the organization, just kind of like a lot of the advocacy groups work right now that are not <coughs> government entities where essentially they have their good and bad bills of the week, they send it out to their members, they help organize, um, support or oppose, meaning you know people showing up to committee, um, where it, it rarely impacts just one or two political subdivisions, usually a lot, you know, when we have legislation that does. Um, and then, you know, that is a total exemption from the lobby registration okay. laws. Would it, because I, I, I don't want taxpayer funded lobbying, but I'm trying to make sure that, I, and I think you've addressed it well, that it, it, it would not preclude cities, counties, geopolitical subdivisions from being informed, because the the real difficulty for, for many of my geopolitical subdivisions is I've got two counties that make up almost 50% of my population and then the other 10 counties that are not as robust financially, you know, Hill, Bosque, uh, Comanche, Hamilton, Eastland, uh, if each of those individual counties now has to hire somebody to, to track, it, it creates a, a division of labor that is so great the efficiencies would, would be questioned. Um, but I want to make sure that we're not impeding the ability of local governments to be informed while we're also impeding the taxpayer-funded lobbying. So it would break that, that connection so that they can still be informed. So I think you've done that well. It would allow the, uh, uh, the geopolitical subdivisions the ability to track without executing the, the 305 chapter, it bifurcates the money, uh, the money aspects, the funding, so it creates an individual membership structure. So I think your committee substitute addresses those questions because I, I want to support the bill, I'm going to support the bill, but I wanted to make sure that with most of us that, for those of us that have a substantial amount of rural Texas that does not have as much robust ability to do the, the bill tracking, uh, that they can coalesce together, have a mechanism to be able to do that. I think you've addressed that with TAC and TML as well. So thank you for the committee substitute. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman. And, and we want to encourage that. You know, I've heard this from a lot of our, especially our rural counties, rural cities, rural school districts, where it's hard to keep up with what's going on. And we want to make sure, and it, it is allowed and encouraged, these bill tracking and legislative analysis and all the things that happen in the interim as well. You know, we're only in session every other year, right? So. Uh, there's a lot of legal advice and risk pool issues and, you know, how do we navigate state agencies and all these things like that that occur. And that does not require you to register. You're only, you only register when you're influencing the outcome of legislation, right? Um, so, I mean, I really believe that the, the most effective way, you know, is to put that out to the members through bill tracking. Hey, this is a bad bill. This is a good bill. Uh, it's being heard this day. Here's why. Here are the points for it. Here are the points against it. You know, and, and I think that's, that is an effective uh, way to, to get people to the Capitol and inform them of what's going on, and that does not trigger the lobby registration laws. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Bergwell. Senator Perry, you're recognized. Thank you. So I just got the sub here a second ago. So <clears throat> just in layman's very succinct, if I'm understanding what you're doing, you're taking tack out of basically the, and, and that's important to me with my counties. I've got, you know, probably of my 41 or whatever it is now, I've probably got three urban and the rest are all rural. So, but if they remove themselves as, and, and go to a member, so back up. So they can do everything they're doing today, except hire someone under 305 and leave their membership from the county, or you've got to take that off and go to the membership as an individual? No, they, we kind of talked about two different things with Senator Birdwell. So under the bill, they, they really have a few choices here. So one is continue to operate as they do today where they only represent government, and they just can't hire a contract with someone required to register as a lobbyist. Or two, um, what could happen is we could convert or they could convert to like our police, fire, so and other organizations where then they're individual organizations and it's their choice whether or not they want to hire lobbyists that's required to register under 305 and they're not in the bill anymore at that point. So this, this is a prohibition on government sending money directly to taxpayer funded lobbyists where we, we don't really get that choice, you know, like 
individuals do when they're choosing to belong to a teacher's association, taxpayers don't get that choice because it's property tax money typically going directly to a registered right. Austin lobbyist. And that's kind of the problem with the for speech aspect of this issue. So if a current tax, it wasn't employing 305 qualified criteria people, then nothing changes? Nothing changes at all. Okay. Senator Bencourt, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you've had a long history with this bill, have you not? Um, and I think that uh, at least uh, somebody that has uh, filed this bill and gotten it out of the Senate uh, in prior years, I can remember you on the other end of this. So you want to go over your history of this? Uh, it's uh, got a long history. Um, so it's, it's always the first bill I file every single session. Uh, as you remember, we had three specials, so that meant I filed it uh, four <laughs> times in the 87th. <laughs> well, so, you know, I, I've, this is my third session, and, but not the third time that I filed this bill, uh, is the long and the short of that. But, you know, at the end of the day, one of the things that really um, first alerted me how, how bad this issue is, is how many lobbyists we saw against property tax limits and reform. And, you know, every taxpayer in this state right now is saying you got to do something about property taxes, right? I mean, so that is, if we're being directly accountable to our voters and taxpayers, and that's an issue we've got to address, well, what happens when that local tax money is used to hire lobbyists that then are lobbying against the taxpayers? And then, it, of course, it goes into parents as well. Um, you know, that's another issue that we've got where, you know, there are a lot of parents here today. Um, and they want a greater voice in their child's education. We've seen, you know, um, certain taxpayer-funded lobby groups that lobby against parents. I mean, you know, one of them in particular integrated critical race theory in their statement of beliefs on their website, you know, and that, that's still there even after we passed the ban on uh, critical race theory, so it still exists. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate that taxpayers are having to subsidize speech that they really don't agree with. Um, and that's really what this issue largely comes down to, is we really don't get a choice. And the thing is, is like, you know, in local government, the emails are open recordsable, the phone records, the budget, um, everything about their hiring practices. That's not the case with hired gun registered lobbyists. We really don't know what's happening. You know, and Senator, no, I, it, after spending three years on the road trying to get uh, Senate Bill 2 passed, uh, with people at this table, uh, you know, on the committee. Uh, yes, that, that uh, got my attention too, the number of paid lobbyists that were against that bill. Uh, and that's why I uh, had a history of filing that bill and, and passing it for a couple sessions. I'm glad to see that there's youthful reinforcements in the process at this point in time. Um, let's talk about, uh, uh, about what this bill does not do, because I think it's important, because we've kind of skipped over it. Um, I don't see anywhere in this substitute that SB 15 would prohibit city or county elected officials, officers, employees from providing information to members of the legislature, from appearing before committee hearings at the request of a member, or from advocating on election while acting in their official capacities. Am I missing any of that? That's correct. There's a very broad exemption for political subdivisions of the state and employees of political subdivisions of the state from having to register. Um, we all see a lot of government relations people around this building and they're not registered lobbyists because they don't have to be. Right. And um, I see that you kept from one of my old copies the injunctive relief section uh, in case somebody does violate that. I think it's important that citizens be able to object to having taxpayer money spent on something that, especially if the bill passes both houses, which I hope your bill will this time, uh, it, you know, it's important that they have some type of ability to have an enforcement clause. Would you agree? I agree. Um, and I've always believed, you know, the best enforcement is a taxpayer suit, the one that's being harmed, um, is the best watchdog for taxpayer dollars. And so that's why we make sure to empower taxpayers to be the watchdog to make sure this is properly enforced. Right. And I've refiled my transparency bill from uh, last session, which is now uh, members under 2330. I believe the last time it was voted on the Senate, it passed unanimously. So uh, looking forward to that hearing at some time in the future, Mr. Chairman. Senator Parker, you're recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Senator Middleton, thanks for bringing this forward today. And, and I just had a couple of questions. I know we've already had a good bit of recap and, and talked about this a good bit over the years. But, you know, um, I think I maybe even shared with you earlier today that uh, one of my uh, counties, a, a rural county that is uh, smaller, um, has some concerns, obviously, about the bill. I think a lot of the things that we discussed this morning have covered that. But the principal, I think, issue that uh, has always concerned me is with regard to some of the smaller communities in particular. A lot of the larger cities have the ability to, because um, of their budget size, uh, to hire government affairs uh, folks on a full-time basis, uh, whereas a lot of the smaller communities can't. So just maybe, uh, again, just kind of set the record, uh, give folks your perspective on the substitute on how we address those issues, that uh, it's not um, taking away a voice, if you will, for smaller communities and smaller counties, so to speak, in the state. Right. I think the important point in that is that it preserves the associated services that I hear a lot about. Um, we have a very small county, uh, Rail County, Brad Hart. I think they've got 2,700 people in Rail County, and he is in support of the bill. Um, and he said one of the reasons, you know, I've talked to a lot of uh, local elected officials about this is they wanted to make sure, and, and it does do this, it preserves their ability to continue to receive those legal services, those risk pool services, the legal advice, the continuing education, the legislative tracking, the bill reading, the bill analysis, the bill recommendations, the daily alerts sometimes, because it does come down to daily alerts as we get farther into session of what's moving quickly. Um, and, and you know, those are the things that I hear are of the greatest value to our, especially to our rural cities, rural counties, uh, rural school districts, and that is protected in this. Um, and I will say that, you know, one of the things about the associations representing uh, a large number of political subdivisions is it's really hard uh, when you got 254 counties to faithfully represent all 254. You're gonna hear more about that today. The same with, you know, what we have almost 1,200 school districts, um, a lot of cities, I'm not sure of the number maybe, Senator Betancourt can update on, I think it's close to 1,000 or more than 1,000. Slightly above. Yeah, slightly above 1,000. Um, so that's why that is so important because they can't be that unique voice for rural Texas. They can tell you what's going on and then it provides you the information you need to come and advocate for those issues that are important to the unique needs of your county. And you know, we see that with like, this is one of the reasons that this issue's bothered me as well. Like on the Gulf Coast, Texas Windstorm Insurance Association, right? There are 14 coastal counties in that. And that's from Beaumont to Brownsville. Right. That's a lot of people, you know? And it's not just homeowners that are suffering. It's not just business owners that are suffering from increasing one storm rates because you can't have a mortgage without one storm insurance, right? It's counties, cities, and school districts that are also suffering from that but the associations never show up to support the bills that would lower windstorm rates. So it's really unfortunate to see that they're really not doing a very good job representing their members' best interest here in the Capitol. And you're, you're gonna hear more on that here later today, but that's just a snapshot of one issue that I've been through myself where, you know, lowering windstorm rates would benefit all 14 tier one coastal counties, but they're not here to do that. Um, and, and that's why I think uh, making sure that we, we protect that bill tracking service so they're aware of those kind of things because the best advocate on those issues are going to be the counties that are directly impacted by it. And this bill protects that to make sure that, that they're still able to do that and, and receive that service. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mays. Uh, so, any, any other questions for the author before we begin testimony? Thank you very much. And these questions are obviously helpful, and Senator Middle has been working on this, and many of us have heard from our elected officials back home, but want to make sure they understand how it works, and so I'm, this discussion is always helpful. We'll open testimony at this time and call the following invited witnesses on Senate Bill 175. The chair calls Melissa Martin, Honorable Hank Doogie, or Dougie, I'm sorry, Honorable Julie Pickering. I should know how to pronounce the name of our our county treasurer in Galveston County, but I will. And so, uh, Melissa Martin, Hank Dougie, and Honorable Julie Pickren, please make your way and find a seat there. Yeah. 
and we generally go from uh, well, left to right for us, right to left for you all. So please introduce yourself, give us your testimony, and welcome. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. Uh, my name is Hank Doogie, and I have the honor of hopefully serving as the last and final county treasurer in Galveston County. Uh, I know I've met with many of you and some of your staff uh, about what's going on in Galveston County, and I'll provide uh, my testimony here a little bit later uh, in regards to what we're doing locally and how it relates to SB 175. Uh, I am in favor of SB 175, uh, the ban of the cancer that is taxpayer-funded lobbying. And I also want to alert you to uh, nefarious activity that is going on uh, in the state of Texas by said taxpayer-funded lobbyist. I have a long history in local government. I started my uh, service on city council in League City before being elected uh, to a countywide office in Galveston County. I have long been a fan of the services provided by local government associations such as TML and TAC uh, for their risk pool management, uh, for the uh, legislation tracking that they provide, uh, but the lobbying that they do is horrendous. Uh, and is non-representative of the voters uh, here in Galveston County or across the state of Texas. Um, these organizations have co-opted the clout, the status, the office of local elected officials to use for their own special interests and purposes. These lobbyists misrepresent their members and misrepresent themselves as a pseudo-government organization uh, with representative authority. So how are they not representative? First off, uh, they're not elected by voters. They might be made up of elected officials who are elected, uh, but these organizations uh, are not elected by voters to represent them in uh, matters of legislation. Uh, these folks do not uh, post agendas or have open dialogue about uh, legislative priorities. The decisions that are made by these organizations are made at the top uh, by staff, by consultants, by lobbyists, uh, and then spoon-fed down to elected officials to kind of carry out their message. I ran very openly and transparently in Galveston County to eliminate my office, the Office of County Treasurer. I defeated a 20-year incumbent and a third challenger without having to go to a runoff election. The citizens of Galveston County overwhelmingly support what we are trying to do uh, while eliminating the treasurer's position and becoming the 10th county in Texas to do so. TAC has uh, intervened and um, gone office to office and told uh, different legislators and staff misrepresent themselves uh, by saying that Galveston County is against the item, that the county treasurer is against the item, I am the county treasurer. Uh, I am for SJR 28. Uh, I am for eliminating the office of Galveston County Treasurer. Uh, for, for them to be a uh, pseudo-government organization that uh, pretends to represent elected officials across the state and to go and misrepresent, misrepresent uh, the facts to the legislature, uh, I think it's horrendous. It needs to be stopped. There's a number of instances that they've misrepresented themselves. Uh, in the 87th session, they told the County Affairs Committee members on the House side uh, that the County Commissioner's Court were not in support of uh, the item. The County Commissioner's Court voted unanimously uh, and bipartisanly uh, in support of the item, uh, but the committee members were told that the Commissioner's Court did not support it. Here in the 88th session, I've met with over 100 uh, legislative offices, and I've uh, found the same thing to be true. Uh, these paid taxpayer-funded lobbyists are going into uh, offices and telling them that the current treasurer and the commissioner's court are against uh, our local bill, um, which could not be further from the truth. We have, once again, unanimous support from the commissioner's court, and we have support of myself, the elected treasurer, and 12 of 13 cities within the county have passed resolutions in support of uh, our local bill. Uh, so. Um, not only are they not representative on their face, but they're also misrepresenting the facts to the legislature. Uh, and I think this bill, SB 175, uh, is a big step in the right direction to protect taxpayers from being uh, misrepresented here at the legislature. Uh, 
one last thing to note, uh, in my race, um, there was some electioneering uh, taking place by uh, Texas Association of Counties uh, against me and in support of my uh, opponent. Um, they are well-funded and well-connected. Uh, they use their influence to uh, do what it is that they want to do and not what taxpayers or citizens in Texas uh, want their elected officials to do. So uh, as a local elected official, I think we need to keep the good from these associations uh, and do away with the bad, uh, which is the lobbying activities. I'm available for any questions, and thank you for your time and for your service to the great state of Texas. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Martin, and I'm here to speak on behalf of myself. I want to speak in favor of Senate Bill 175. I'm a public school teacher here in Texas, and I'm in my 23rd year of teaching. I'm not here as a representative of my school district or my campus. During my career, I've watched some troubling trends in education, and I'm especially troubled by the direction that TASB has taken our education system. I've watched over the years as parents have been excluded from decisions that impact their own children, and recently I've been very concerned by the advice that TASB has provided to school board trustees related to students and their gender. As a teacher, I believe we should always include parents in any issue related to their child, and I'm angry that we would ever, as teachers, be directed to keep information away from parents. TASB is undermining the parent-child relationship with their recommendations, and this is also undermining the trust that parents have for teachers. I'm passionate about my profession, and I resent having an entity like TASB undermine the respect and trust that parents have for teachers. As a teacher, I'm frustrated by TASB's stance on expecting educators to use preferred names and pronouns. For those of us who have traditional values, this appears to be compelled speech. As a parent, I'm frustrated by the recommendations TASB gave regarding bathroom policies related to students who don't identify with their biological birth. I do not believe that tax dollars should ever be spent to lobby for policies that work against the parents, families, and taxpayers that those policies hurt. Schools should be working to strengthen the family unit rather than undermine it. We wonder why behavior in school has become so disruptive and violent that teachers are leaving in droves, but it's a simple lesson in cause and effect. When you cut parents out of the process and discourage teachers from having open lines of communication with parents, the relationship that needs to be in place to hold children accountable for their behavior is destroyed. Not only is the use of tax dollars for lobbying wrong, but it's hurting students and the teachers in our education system. That concludes my prepared remarks. So if you have any questions for me. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome, introduce yourself, even though we know you, and give us your testimony. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Julie Pickren, Texas State Board of Education, representing District 7, the wonderful two and a half million people of District 7. So thank you, Chairman, for inviting me today, and thank you, Senators, for taking up this very important issue for families and children of the state of Texas. So I'm going to read to you from my written statement that I believe you all have a copy of. As Texas State Board of Education member District 7, I serve the residents of the following counties, Brazoria, Chambers, Fort Bend, Galveston, Hardin, Jasper, Jefferson, Liberty, Newton, Orange, Tyler, and a portion of Harris. The constituents of these counties elected me to help ensure parents' rights are protected and children are provided an excellent education in accordance with state law. One of my responsibilities as a member of the Texas State Board of Education is to maintain communication with local and state level officials to discuss roles, I'm sorry, rules, policies, and possible legislation that impact education in my jurisdiction. However, tax funded, taxpayer funded associations, such as Texas Association of School Boards, often referred to as TASB, National School Board Association, often referred to as NSBA, and Texas Library Association, often referred to as TLA, have been working against the constituents of SBOE 7 by employing lobbyists who work against their best interests. NSBA wrote a letter to the Biden administration requesting the U.S. Justice Department use anti-terrorism resources, including the Patriot Act, to target concerned parents who speak up at local school board meetings. 
It was revealed through a document obtained utilizing the Freedom of Information Act. TASB and other affiliated state organizations were notified by NSVA a letter was going to be sent to President Biden accusing parents of domestic terrorism. TASB's response was NSBA missed the mark, and this was characterized as a distraction. However, TASB did eventually sever ties with NSBA after eight months of the FBI being weaponized against parents. Additionally, TASB and their school board trustee training in the fall of 2022 taught best practices that are an affront to parents' rights in SBOE 7. The training consisted of instructing school leadership how to change a child's gender at the request of the student with or without parental knowledge, and school board policies that could allow boys and girls locker rooms and restrooms and vice versa. Additionally, the NSBA has recommended policies for school districts to provide gender transitioning affirmation care to minors while keeping it confidential from parents. It is our tax dollars being used to deprive parents of their God-given right to make health decisions for their children. TASB and NSBA are funded with our tax dollars at the local school board level. TASB and NSBA have also advocated for and promoted the Biden administration's expansion of Title IX. The TASB policy expands Title IX protections to biological males who identify as a female. This is in direct opposition to Texas Save Women's Sports Act, signed into law in 2021. Also, the Fifth and Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals have issued rulings against portions of the vital Title IX expansion based on gender identity. Another taxpayer-funded lobbyist group that is working against the will of the constituents of Texas SBOE, SBOE 7 is the Texas Library Association. TLA at their 2022 conference hosted training sessions by Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, a national proponent of critical race theory, and training sessions hosted by adult entertainers Justin Johnson and Joseph Hoselton. Mr. Johnson and Mr. Hoselton were dressed as women while instructing school leaders and librarians best practices for hosting drag queen story hours in our city, county, and school libraries. Also, TLA hosted a training on how to keep pornographic materials on bookshelves while referencing parents are the number one group requesting porno pornographic materials be removed from children's libraries. Parents and community members of SBOE 7 are working hard to pay their school district property taxes to maintain a home for their family. Unfortunately, these hard-earned tax dollars are being used to advocate for rules and policies that take away parents' God-given right to make decisions for their children. It is time we take away the power from taxpayer-funded lobbyists in Austin and in Washington, D.C., and give the power back to parents, local taxpayers, and their elected officials. God bless Texas. Julie Pickren. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, members, any questions for uh, any of the three witnesses? Senator Middleton. Uh, thank you all three for coming, Hank and Melissa and Julie. And I just, uh, to kind of clarify kind of what you've been through here on the county treasurer's issue. Um, so that was your platform was I'm running to eliminate the job, right? Right. And you beat an incumbent on that, right? right. Um, and this priority to eliminate the treasurer's office uh, was unanimously adopted by commissioner's court. Right, unanimously supported by a bipartisan court. And, and cities all over Galveston County support it. Um, there's near unanimity in it. Um, there's just uh, almost no argument that, that uh, there's, there's not local support because there's unanimous local support. Um, and you've seen, despite all of that, the Texas Association of Counties through one of their subsidy organizations lobby against the bill and lie and say that you're not for it and the locals would be forced to uh, accept something that they don't want. Yeah, so I've gone to you know over 100 different legislative offices and they have been visited by a paid lobbyist. They like to call themselves consultants. Uh, and they have come in and told them, one, that this bill will eliminate every county treasurer in the state of Texas, which is patently untrue. And they've said, two, the treasurer, me, is not, against, not for it and that the county commissioners court are not for it. 
They did it in the 87th session. They did it in the 88th session. Uh, at, I went to a TAC breakfast, legislative breakfast, and at the event I had other TAC members coming up to me, shaking my hand, saying, Hank, I have your back. You have our support. We're going to protect your position. And I said, hold on one second. I ran to eliminate my office. I don't need any protection for my position. I'm here to shut it down. And they said, oh, well, we were told that you wanted to keep it. And I said, no. So not only are they misrepresenting themselves to the legislature, they're misrepresenting themselves to other members of TAC and other local elected officials across the state. Um, so you can imagine how that makes it difficult to get good legislation passed here in Austin. So basically, in this case, you know, they support local control until they don't agree what the locals want. Right, and it's, yeah. these aren't items that are being voted on in a democratic process by TAC members. This is issues that are being brought forward by uh, the upper echelon and consultants and lobbyists, and then being spoon fed to the members as their legislative agenda. So, uh, yeah, it's not a representative body. It's not what we won in Galveston County. And I think if the other TAC members knew that I was in favor of eliminating my office, they'd probably support me. But they're being told otherwise by uh, TAC. Thank you. And, and for, for Julie here, so you, you went into, and Melissa as well, a lot of detail on TASB and how they've you know, gone against the will of what teachers want, against what parents want. Um, do you think that one of the issues with this uh, particular subject is that they represent the government body uh, as a school board, but not the individual trustees? Um, Yes, so we have seen across the state of Texas parents actually being very vocal with their votes. We have had more than 20 school boards in the state of Texas flip now to a more conservative point of view of, of protecting parents' rights. But what's happening is the superintendents are automatically enrolling these new trustees into TASB, even though these trustees are saying they do not want to be part of the organization because they do not share their common values. And, and do you think that TASB, you know, I mean, here, here's kind of the thing, it's not just TASB, it's TAC, TML, and TASB, the majority of their revenue is selling single bid, no bid, risk pool insurance. So for example, TASB makes about $150 million a year off that and have a half billion dollars in assets. Um, do you believe that they're largely representing who pays the most into the risk pool? Absolutely. That, that would be my opinion on that. Which are the large ISDs, the large cities, the large counties. Um, and of course, you know, they manage the entire <laughs> school district reserve fund under the Lone Star Investment Pool, um, which is approximately $15 billion uh, as well. So um, you can see why, you know, they would not represent individual school board trustees when you're talking about the business of risk pool insurance and the business of managing the reserve funds as well. Um, and, you know, I guess w one of the other questions that I had is, um, and, and I think this probably needs a, a little more fleshing out, you've tried to work with them to change some of these things, correct? Where I have. Before elected to the state position, I was a school board trustee of one of the fastest growing school districts in Texas for many years. And so I was actually an alternate delegate to uh, TASB's delegate convention. And yes, we, we have tried, me and several other elected trustees have tried to work with them, but they are pretty singularly focused on just representing a, um, a very liberal point of view that is contrary to a lot of parents feelings and sentiments now thank you all right well thank you um senator middleton thank you witnesses appreciate you being here today thank you thank you senator The chair calls John Welch, Thomas Chauvin, and Joel Castro. Um, additionally, we do have J.R. Johnson here as a resource witness. And also Michelle Davis. John Welch, Thomas Chauvin, Joel Castro, J.R. Johnson, and Michelle Davis.
right, well, thank you for being here. And if you don't mind, let's just start on this side and make our way across. Um, thank you for being here. And if you'll just state your name for the record and then give us your testimony. My name is John Welch, and I'm here today in my capacity as a school board trustee to lobby you on the adoption of SB 175. I am not representing our board, nor our district, but myself only. I am not being paid to be here today. No organization is covering the cost for me to be here either. I was elected to the board of Lamar CISD several years ago. We're located in the far west southwest portion of the greater Houston area. We currently have 42,000 students, over 5,500 employees, and are considered the fastest growing ISD in the state when you count new housing starts. As you know, state law prohibits me from being paid as a trustee. I make even less money than you guys do as senators. This makes me a volunteer of the school district. I spend as much personal time on the district as I do work at work making a living. My district pays TASB, the Texas Association of School Boards, $11,000 per year for me and the other six trustees to be members. All Texas ISDs are members of TASB. Through our membership, the district has offered co-op discounts on things like utility purchases and bus fuel. And those kind of things are good. But I have a problem with the direction that TASB leans when it comes to public education. Instead of being politically neutral, large organizations such as TASB, who have a seemingly endless amount of public money, always seem to lean left in their advocacy. What groups like this seek is more power in this building. Allowing taxpayer funds uh, to such lobbying activity is not a good use of tax dollars. As I said, I'm here today covering my own cost to, for the adoption of SB 175. As a taxpayer myself, it makes no sense to me why organizations such as TASB can use portions of the money that we pay them to walk the very halls of this building because their thrust does not represent all of the public, the ones who are forced to fund the ISDs around the state. There are plenty of privately funded entities out there who can have their reps come and talk to you on behalf of public education. Taxpayer money should not be used even for charter schools. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Hughes, Vice Chairman Paxton, and esteemed members of the committee. I'm Thomas Shanebine, Councilman for District H for the City of Pasadena. I'm here representing myself and my constituents in my district. According to the Texas Public Policy Foundation, taxpayers spent a total of about $75 million on contract lobbyists during the last session of the state legislature. We need to end taxpayer-funded lobbying, which is inherently a corrupt uh, practice. Contract lobbyists hired with taxpayer dollars often work against us in our interest of our taxpayers, opposing legislation to provide property tax relief and fighting for reforms that would reduce the rate of growth in governmental spending. Taxpayer dollars are also being spent by lobbyists against legislation for our school choice. Our tax dollars should not be working against taxpayers' desires for our communities. Taxpayer-funded lobbyists should not have the ability to use conservative values uh, working against us to promote conservative priorities, including property tax relief, election integrity, or students competing in athletically and intercollegiate competitions outside of their biological birth gender. Prohibiting taxpayer-funded lobbying by local municipal cities will be a step in reining in local spending and restoring our constituents' trust. As a councilman, I support pro prohibiting taxpayer-funded lobbyists. I am more than willing to share with my constituents uh, their point of views and concerns with this great body here in the state of Texas. I'd like to thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, let's get this bill passed. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Yes, could you state your name and then give us your testimony? Hi, my name is Joel Castro. I uh, work with Americans for Prosperity, but on the side, I, uh, I'm also on city council. I've been on city council for about six years now, and we all know that $75 million have been used of taxpayer funds, uh, mostly used against taxpayers uh, with taxpayer fund lobbying. And with a growing state like Texas, um, in a growing place like Alvin, Texas, uh, that $75 million can go to uh, infrastructure, public safety, but more importantly, in the pockets, back into the pockets of Texans. 
Um, TML, they have a monopoly uh, all across Texas with, with municipalities. Um, and their one size fits all, which uh, is actually more like a one size fits few uh, policies they have, um, do not represent my constituents and they don't represent a lot of rural suburban areas. Um, you know, I, I know that the, their lobbyists are probably nice people, uh, but they're out of touch. Uh, someone in downtown Austin that's uh, collecting a six-figure salary is not uh, in touch with a blue-collar, hard worker uh, Texan in, in Alvin, Texas, that really works and uh, pinches, uh, pinches their pennies uh, to make ends meet. Um, those those uh, taxpayer-funded lobbyists do not represent the 27,000 people in Alvin, Texas, I do. Um, and times and times again, that they have lobbied against uh, the taxpayers and Texans. It's up to local elected officials to be the voice, whether that's in city hall and, uh, and, and school administration buildings, but especially here in the state capitol, uh, when we can come here, like, like we're all doing today, uh, to be able to, to testify in committee and talk to our state reps and talk to our state senators. Um, but, you know, if that doesn't, uh, that doesn't work out, but we get our option to vote every two years and every four years for our senator. Um, I urge y'all to please uh, support and pass SB um, 175, and thank y'all so much for y'all's time and for your service to Texas. Thank you so much for your testimony. Would you please state your name for the record and then give us your testimony? Sure. My name is Michelle Davis. I am presently a trustee on a school board down in Galveston County. Um, so I, I appreciate Senator Bettencourt taking us down that memory lane uh, just a few minutes ago. It's, it has been a very interesting ride for sure. So the Texas Municipal League has, has, is famous for educating local governing bodies on how to, how they can shake the money tree to raise taxes to fund government expansion. Um, that's not something to be proud of. I don't say it uh, in a, in a, a positive way. Uh, the district that I work for last year paid over $80,000 for administration memberships with over $19,000 of that going to TASB alone. Um, I think they, they could uh, serve the citizens better by paying an employee to track legislation rather than to pay this outside entity to lobby our, um, our senators and and um, lawmakers. Uh, given, that, given that there are approximately 1,000 Texas school districts, if we're by far not the biggest, not the smallest, but 1,000 school districts, that works out to be $19 million annually that TASB would take in. That's just a guess, but I don't think it's too, I, I, I don't think it's too far off the mark. That's a lot of taxpayer dollars available to try to influence legislators' votes. Um, we don't know how much these lobbyists are paid, but I bet their personal tax returns would be very interesting to see. Um, I, as a volunteer with Convention of States, it had been hammered into my head, we can't even take donuts into our legislator's office because we have to worry about um, lobbying them. Um, and I think it's appalling that our lobbyists are using our taxpayer dollars against us. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And Mr. Johnson, I believe you're our um, resource witness. That's right. Thank you, Senators. J.R. Johnson, Executive Director of the Texas Ethics Commission. Honored and pleased to be here, but I am here solely as a resource. Okay. Thank you. Members, do you have any questions for um, our witnesses? All right. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. Really appreciate it. And members, it is our intention um, to wrap up at 1.30 so that the uh, Senate staff can reset the room uh, for session at 2. So I think we have time for one more panel of witnesses. All right, the chair calls Doug Williams, 
Liz Case Pickens, Connie Schroeder, Ron Jensen, and Dan Davis. Doug Williams, Liz Case Pickens, Connie Schroeder, Ron Jensen, and Dan Davis. Appreciate you all being here today. This will be a LIFO, last in, first out. So we'll start on this end and just make our way across. If you'd state your name and give us your testimony, please. Thanks for being here. Sure, thank you. Mayor Ron Jensen, City of Grand Prairie, and goodness, uh, I'm opposed to the bill as it's written. Listen to all the testimony, you'd say, well, why would a mayor be in opposition to this bill? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, I've the 17th largest city in the state of Texas, four counties, a horse race track, five school districts. It's not just about tracking. I get it. We can have somebody track it. I have, anybody can track it. I can't, I just don't have time. It's more than that. The picture y'all painted today is lobbyists are somehow trying to circumvent voters. Our lobbyists don't do anything down here that our council doesn't tell them to do. We have a legislative agenda. They work to that legislative agenda. It's more than just keeping track of bills. I need help understanding the bill. This doesn't prevent that. I understand that. But I need somebody down here communicating. Senator Birdwell will take every call I make to him. But I don't call him every time. Goodness, I need somebody down here talking to y'all, giving me feedback. Uh, the racing bill. There's competing, you know, the Sands Hotel. Y'all aren't going to prevent them from being down here spending millions of dollars. The Chickasaws, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws have the rights to our racetrack, horse racetrack, and I hope to have a casino there someday. But I've got to have somebody down here helping me understand all these bills and communicating with the leaders down here, the leadership down here, on things we need in that bill. You're not preventing us from calling down here. What you're preventing is me having a paid lobbyist doing it, but I could have a staff person doing it. So what you're going to force me to do, I'm not going to save any money. What you're going to force me to do is change how I pay for it. Plain and simple. And thank I you. just... Thank you for your testimony. Senator Menendez, you have a question. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, your legislative agenda that your city supports uh, do you get to decide what's on that by yourself, or does any one council person, or is it a majority? All the council comes together in a briefing. We give them input, and they bring it back to us uh, for a consensus. Right. That's how it's done. So, so the council that's elected by the people and you that are elected by the people, you all have a, a, a say in what you're going to be adopting and pushing. And you don't always, you can also send a letter, say, if TML takes a position on something that you don't agree with, you can make that. We can opt out of it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Uh, are there any other questions? All right. Thank you for your testimony. Would you please identify yourself and give us your testimony? Yes, ma'am. Well, good afternoon, y'all. My name is Dan Davis. I reside in Mammal, Texas, which is 30 minutes south of Houston. Woke up 4 o'clock this morning to drive up here, beat Houston traffic, but as y'all know, you can't beat Austin traffic. I'm here today to testify for Senate Bill 175. I was elected to City Council in Mammal in 2019. And if you would have asked me then if I would have supported banning taxpayer-funded lobbying, I would have said no. It's a government entity's freedom of speech to be able to lobby Austin, and it's elected officials' rights to be able to make these decisions with the taxpayer dollars. But now I'm vehemently opposed to those ideas that I had four years ago. First off, governmental entities do not have freedom of speech rights. It's the people that have those rights that are bestowed upon them by their creator. Government has the authority that is granted by the people. My city council, when I served, sadly never went to the people to get their input on the legislative policies that they brought forward. Secondly, 
What I've seen firsthand happening here in Austin is that taxpayer-funded lobbyists time and time again advocate against the will of the people. I've been up here. I've taken time myself to travel to Austin to testify on reining in the abuse by local entities and how they utilize certificate of obligation, non-voter approved debt. I was one of the few who testified for that bill. But countless taxpayer-funded lobbyists advocated against that bill because they wanted to see their clients who make their pocketbooks bigger, they wanted to see their clients be able to continue to circumvent the will and the voice of the people. 69% of Texans agree with my opinion. Over 20 million people agree with my opinion. What we're asking for you guys to do is to protect the First Amendment rights of every single Texan because we do not have the funds that the lobbyists have. So by supporting this bill, by continuing to push it forward, you are protecting me, my kids, my family, and our future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Menendez, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. One question for the Councilman. Uh, I can appreciate your long drive and getting up early. I, I commute to San Antonio and back every day. Um, you mentioned that governments don't have freedom of speech, that people do, correct? Yes, sir. So then, in hearing you, would you agree then or disagree with the Supreme Court decision that corporations are to be respected as individual people for freedom of speech? I would disagree with that. You would individual agree. people do, they make up the corporation. The corporation is nothing without the people. I know, I agree as well. Um, unfortunately, that's the law of the land today. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Any other questions? All right. Uh, thank you for your testimony. And uh, would you uh, state your name and then give us your testimony? Good afternoon, Chair Paxton. Thank you so much, honorable committee members, for your service. My name is Connie Schrader, and I'm mayor of the city of Bastrop. I'm here today respectfully to speak in opposition to Senate Bill 175. According to the Comptroller's website, there's over 1,200 municipalities in the state of Texas. 400 of those have a population of less than 1,000. The city of Bastrop is just over 11,000 and growing daily. I'm dedicated to serving my constituents to the best of my ability. I have no staff. The 88th legislative session filed bills between November 14th and March 10th. Final count showed over 8,200 bills and resolutions. Of those, roughly 2,500 will impact municipalities, mandating everything from the number of chickens and rabbits in each backyard to prohibiting regulation of commercial activity. 8,200 bills and resolutions is certainly an impressive amount of work. As mayor, between January 10th and March 10th, I participated, spoke, and facilitated 83 events, including five council meetings, three economic development board meetings, nine chamber meetings, six ribbon cuttings, and yes, I joined a Bali X flash mob for our first Friday event. I'm not bragging or whining, I'm just stating facts. I'm honored to serve as the mayor, but it takes time to do the day-to-day. If this bill passes between March 10th and May 10th, my duties as mayor won't be any different, but you would like me to add lobbying on 2,500 bills to my schedule. I appreciate that I'll be allowed to still have some information from TML, but tracking bills and lobbying for bills is two completely different things. I know that there's a concern about pay. The city pays $2,474 to be a member of TML. That's 46 cents per year per residential. So I want to make sure that we're putting into perspective the funds. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions? All right, thank you. All right, go ahead. Good afternoon, members. My name is Doug Williams. I'm superintendent with Sunnyvale ISD and TASA, TASA uh, past president. I'm here to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 175. Uh, this bill, in my opinion, would dramatically limit capital access to school districts as we advocate for our teachers and students. Uh, before I was a school administrator, I was a government teacher. And one of the things we talked about in government was that um, constituents should have access to government itself. Uh, and then that should be limited only in very, uh, in very uh, rare circumstances and in matters of public interest. 
Uh, many bills are of great interest this session, and I believe that government must show a compelling reason to limit access of individuals or groups. This bill, in my opinion, does not show that compelling reason. Um, if, if, uh, if this bill is passed, I believe that school districts will be harmed in the legislative process. In the last session, there were over 1,000 education bills filed. Um, I have a full-time job. I am the superintendent of a school district of around 2,200 students. I am here today because we're on spring break, and so I have the opportunity to come. Um, our lobbyists keep us informed on bills, but they also provide school perspective to legislators, and I think that's very important. Uh, and we must have uh, representation here because uh, Legislation, uh, for the legislative process to be fair, both perspectives must be heard. For schools of my size and even smaller school districts, this is the most effective way uh, for representation. Finally, I'll close with this. Uh, this decision is, should be a local decision. School boards do have the, the authority to decide whether or not they, uh, these funds can be spent in this manner. And for our school district, we spend less than $5,000 in a $23 million budget on what would be considered lobbying efforts. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions? All right, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Liz Case Pickens. I'm from SD28, and I'm here as a parent who is concerned about parental rights I'm concerned about being labeled as a domestic terrorist if I want to go and lobby my school board and um, let them know that um, I'm concerned about the um, issues in our children's education. As a former educator, um, I am very concerned about the things that are happening in our schools. Um, one of our main jobs as educators is our relationship with our students. We also have a trust with our parents, and I can't imagine the encouragement to educators to break that trust. No matter what your political views are as a teacher, you have a responsibility to uphold parental rights. And TASB encouraging teachers to go against that in gender issues and other things is unconscionable. Um, it also concerns me what TLA is doing in our community in Abilene. We have pornography in our public libraries that is against our community standards. It's something that we are vehemently fighting, but the lobbying efforts that are going on are um, very detrimental to not only my community, but communities all across the state. The money that is being put forward against our citizens is something that no matter how much we're down here, we cannot fight against that. This is an important bill that I encourage you to support. Thank you. For putting it forward. Thank you. And let me just clarify, we have you registered as on the bill. Um, um, I am for the bill. For the bill. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll get that reflected. Senator Perry, you're recognized. I just wanted to say thanks for driving down from Senate District 28. Um, I know you face and I see you're around. You're definitely engaged and, um, you know, we fight the lack of engagement. If people were engaged, 99% of these issues we talk about down here wouldn't be there, but everybody leads busy lives. But thank you for taking the time to come down here. Thank you, Senator Perry. Senator Birdwell, you're recognized. Say, thank you, Mayor Jensen, for your kind words, because, we, you know, we're trying to prevent taxpayer-funded lobbying, but not, uh, not render you inefficient or, or, or incapacitated to be able to, because you're particularly what, who I had in mind, because you're in Dallas and Tarrant County, and I think eight other jurisdictions that you overlap with. And even we're not in session, you've got a problem to track everything going on around you. So appreciate thank you. Thank you for joining us. Representing us. Who was? Senator. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Birdwell. Um, thank you so much for coming today and giving us your testimony. Uh, we are going to um, recess um, 
until it is the intent of the chair to reconvene 30 minutes after the adjournment uh, of our session. And so with that, uh, we will recess. Thank you, members, and thank you, uh, witnesses.